we're remembering to look at things a little bit more vibrationally and a little less physically, a little less concretely, just because that's the way the structure of existence works. That's the, and that's, that's our nature, is to be more vibrational. We're human beings, not human doings. So many people are focused on what do I need to do? Okay, but what do I need to do? What's the strategy? But okay, the marketing, what do I need to do? And that's why there's so much frustration and, and misery and just pain and suffering. There's that Mark Nepo quote that I live my life by. It says, um, the flower doesn't dream of the bee. It blossoms and the bee comes. And we're live. Welcome back, guys. Welcome, David Lyon. Dude, thank you so much for being here. And I just realized it's a really powerful name. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. <laughs> is that your birth name? Because that was it, a that was a pretty strong start. <laughs> it, it, it is my birth name. My, my family wanted to name me after royalty. So David, King of the Land, Lion, King of the Jungle. Oh, geez. Oh, man. Because I saw on your Instagram, like in your bio, it's like, um, which is a dope Will Smith reference for the Fresh Prince of Spirituality. And it's yeah. funny because I even kind of wrote down as I was like looking through your stuff, I was like, this guy, if, if someone is a prince, this dude definitely gives off prince like vibes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I put that just to kind of like capture the flavor of what I like to offer, you know, because I find spiritual spirituality could also, often be kind of rigid and serious. And mm. I've always loved Fresh Prince of Bel Air and, you know, and how he just brings these kind of fun, goofy vibes to it all. So that's kind of where that came from. Just like, this is the flavor. I like that, dude. Because, I mean, even even kind of through my journey and this like unraveling, which we're going to get more into because I think I'm probably eh, – my spiritual waking probably happened about three-ish years ago. And I saw that you're near your like 11 or 12-year mark. So – yeah. Um, but the, one of the, <laughs> so we got a whole lot to discuss there, but one of the things, cause you kind of brought it up already is like that serious undertone. And it's something that I definitely have seen a lot in my developmental stage. It's like, you know, you always got to be holding high vibes. You always got to be feeling good. Otherwise, you know, you're attracting BS and yada, yada, yada along the way. When did you kind of find that, you know, fun spirit that you injected into it? I want to say always it's, it's just who I am. It's, it's, it's very natural to, to me and to, to who I've always been. You know, I've, I've grown up a very joyful, fun, loving kid, um, very encouraged by my mom. She, she very much nurtured my gifts and whatnot. And I would say probably a lot of it came from, you know, my path started off as a magician, like as a street magician doing, oh, no way. I was inspired by David Blaine. You know, I wanted to be the black David Blaine uh, <laughs> at one point in my life. And so, you know, my, my path and my upbringing had a lot to do with fun and, you know, just blowing minds and that kind of energy. And, I, you know, and, and when I reflect on it now, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, my mom was the type of person, I was just raised by my mom, but she was the type of person who was just like, do what you want, as long as it makes you happy, you have full freedom. And so from a young age, I was very attuned to resonance, you could say, and in terms of like, what feels good for me. So the idea of seriousness and even the idea of hard work in the way that most people relate to it were never my cup of tea. Hmm. Yeah, man. Cause I know that's a message that I still even kind of get penetrated with as I look through Instagram and whatever algorithm I'm dipping my hands into is that hard work, you know, you got to grind, you got to quote unquote suffer. That's what's interesting is it's, there's this like energy behind the words. And even though it's like hard work or working, it seems like suffering tends to be behind those words that people push out when they say to work hard. Totally. You know, it's kind of like the way I see it is like, why work your ass off when you could passion your ass off or joy your ass off, you know? And again, mm -hmm. like referring back to my mom, you know, because she encouraged happiness at such a young age, one of the things I saw growing up is, you know, my mom would work three jobs just to barely make ends meet and she wasn't very happy. So from a, from a kid's perspective, I saw that hard work equals unhappiness and not a lot of money, mm. you know? So it was very, it was at a very young age that I saw that just, that just wasn't the way, at least for me. And it's when I became a magician, you know, when I became a magician, I wasn't looking for a career. I wasn't looking for my purpose. I was actually just looking for a way to make friends. You know, I was a pretty like shy and 
insecure kid and I didn't know how to bridge that gap between me and other people like me and girls and me and the, the, the cool people and so magic was that thing for me and so I, I guess because my intention with it was so pure in the sense of like I just want to have fun I want to blow your mind I want to connect with you through living in that way all of a sudden through having fun people started to offer me opportunities like hey do you want to perform at this birthday or you know could you perform on tv and, and stuff like that so I saw that the more I had fun, the more fun things came to me. And so it, it just made sense to me. And that's how I've been living my life ever since. That's super cool. And it, it sounds like an interesting perspective was kind of picked up there in the beginning, right? With your mom and working, working super hard, probably being stressed out, seeing that for yourself. It's interesting because I kind of see an almost similar corollary with my father who started his own business but he's working super long late nights and he, you know, energetically it seems stressed and can be depleting. And it's interesting because the mentality that I picked up was almost the opposite where it was, okay, in order to have a quote unquote successful business, you need to work hard. You need to be stressed you need to work all these crazy hours. But it's interesting how like, I, I mean, you know, I, I, given the situations, it seems like we almost took different perspectives from a energetically similar experience. Yeah, I, I, I could definitely see that, you know, it's, you know, um, and uh, yeah, again, it, it's that encouragement of happiness on, on my end, you know, where, you know, something I often say is, so I'm someone, my highest priority in life, period, is my highest excitement, my highest joy, my highest inspiration, those flavors of feelings that spark you, that, I, that I'll just call excitement for now. That's my highest priority in life, where a lot of people's highest priority is got to make money got to take care of the family, got to pay the bills, got to grind. And that's valid too. Those are all valid priorities. However, those priorities aren't necessarily inclusive of your highest excitement and joy. Whereas if you prioritize your highest excitement and joy, it's also inclusive of those priorities. So it's just a much mm. better feeling way of, of getting things done. You know, And what I mean by that is if, you're, if you have the audacity and the boldness enough to devote yourself to your highest inspirations, your purpose, your intuitions, those things that call you forth. Because when I'm saying the word highest, such as highest excitement, what I mean is that you're going to have to reach for it a little bit. It's going to scare you a little bit. You know, so your highest excitement might be some sort of leap of faith or to put on some sort of event, you know, so it's going to bring up some nerve. It's going to bring up some insecurities. So the thing is that if we actually are bold enough to devote ourselves to those highest inspirations, those genius flashes that come into our minds, well, that's us choosing to fill up our own cup and give from the overflow, you know, because when we act on our highest excitement and we live it through, that makes us feel more connected to ourselves. And we, when we feel more connected to ourselves, we feel more clear. And when we're more clear, we feel more in flow. And then we're more in synchronicity. And then we're more inspired. So we actually end up being more effective, more productive, and get things done way more effortlessly than if we were to hustle, grind, and force our way through things. Mm. And you might see that frequently. I, I would assume you see it frequently with like your clients or the people you attract into your business. How, almost like, how do you even go about shifting that perspective of, you know, almost inverting the priority ladder, right? It seems like in the West, I'm not, I didn't get to your upbringing or like where you were born, but. It seems like in the West, when I say that, I mean like the United States, for example, it seems like we put that pinnacle on success of these like material measures. And there's some sort of indication that once we have X dollars, X millions of dollars, then we'll be happy. Like then we can allow ourselves to be happy. How do you switch that priority or see that the inverse is, I don't want to say more true, but it can also be true that if we mm -hmm. shift those priorities that we can be happy before receiving, whether it's money, whether it's a person, whether it's a place that we want to live, whether it's a job, how do you, how do you even just go about switching that? I feel like it's a matter of really looking at the common sense of it all. You know, even on a scientific level, there's, a, there's enough scientific evidence to show that we operate at our best when our chemistry, when our emotional chemistry is joyful, as opposed to miserable. Right. Mm. That's 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 something we could all agree upon when we're when we're feeling more joyful, we'll have better thoughts and better flow and we'll have more spaciousness to handle things where if we're feeling miserable, everything will feel like a problem. 
So just on a level of our chemistry, we can see that joyfulness is the way. And so it, it, it's, you know, and this is where one of my mantras is more essence, less effort. Mm. Right. And so once we start to look at the common sense of it all, it's really just understanding that we've just been conditioned with certain things. We've been conditioned to believe that we need to hard, work hard for what you want and no pain, no gain. But if you take a second to actually question those beliefs that were, we were spoon fed, you start to see how they don't actually make the fullest sense. You know, it makes way more sense that if I prioritize my joy, which means I'll more constantly be in states of flow and inspiration and creativity and confidence, there's a much higher likely that I'll get a lot more done and, you know, be more effective and productive and also be a better man in my family and in my relationships while at the same time enjoying myself and life than if I'm doing things the other way around and prioritizing, I just got to get this done, you know, because then that builds stress and frustration and then you start snapping at people and your family members and, and stuff like that, you know, so it's, it's the starting point that I often bring my clients through because it, it is one of the main things that people come to me for. Well, it depends where they are in the path. Usually they've already developed a certain amount of success and now they're looking for fulfillment, to put it in a very short way. You know, they're, they're overworked and they, they want to be overjoyed, let's say. What I invite people to do is if they're willing to take a moment and give themselves a blank canvas on reality. You know, so whatever things they think they need to do, just to let it go for a second, like, okay, you have no idea what needs to be done. You're giving yourself a blank canvas of like, okay, new page. And then to take a moment and to look at what are your current priorities. And chances are, it'll be like money, family, got to get by, you know, surviving. And then look at, well, what would you love your priorities to be? And if you're able, and sometimes it does take some guidance and massaging because sometimes people have such strong beliefs in one direction that they can have a little bit of a hard time shifting at first, but with the right guidance and support, if you're able to show yourself that, well, I would love to prioritize fulfillment. I would love to prioritize joy, but I don't think that that will mean I'll be productive, right? Mm. That's, that's just the ego showing up to say, yeah, but, but that's where I say, okay, stop, let go of the butt for now. Let's just start with what you would love. You know, so, well, yeah, I would love to prioritize more joy, you know, more wholeheartedness, more love, more inspiration. And then stop there and go, okay, well, if you were more joyful, would you see yourself as more connected to yourself? Yes. Well, would you feel more clear? Yeah. Would you have more flow? Would you have more inspiration? Would you be more naturally compassionate? Do you, you know, so you, you start to show yourself logically that it's actually the more optimal way of doing things. And the more you even you start to actually shift your, your priorities in that sense, then your behaviors align different, your thinking aligns different, and you start to have resistance to doing things that feel like effort, for lack of a better word, as opposed to essence. That's interesting, because now you're even diving into the aspect of feeling resistance towards things that are make that are of effort, right? So for example, I know maybe five, six years ago, I always loved getting up early in the morning, just like 4 a.m., get to the gym, work out. And over the last maybe six months, you know, I've been pretty much just sleeping in, like no alarm clock, just letting myself wake up when I wake up, which has usually been like 8, 30, 9-ish. And I kind of had this thing of like, well, I know everyone's talking about like kind of like waking up in the morning, getting that, getting that early start. And there's an element that I loved, but I realized after doing it for about a week that it was crushing my sleep. I was like feeling just drained. And I kind of hit this point of, let's say not knowing if it was not in my best interest or if I was kind of like almost forcing myself to do something due to the outside world or standards. Right. And so it becomes this very interesting dilemma in my opinion between okay, is this internal resistance? Am I just like wanting to take the easy route of quote unquote sleeping in? Or am I, am I taking the easy route of resistance? Or am I just, do I just need to put in that more effort? And so it, it sounds like in your response, it's like, well, just like whatever feels better in your body. Is that a fair assessment? 
there are subtleties to it. You know, there are subtleties. So for example, my highest excitement might be to, um, let's just say, perform on a certain stage. And that's a clear soul level excitement, meaning I could feel the expansiveness of that. I could feel how that's evolutionary for me. And so as I say yes to it, I might have insecurities and things show up that feel like resistances. And so the question I'm going to ask myself then is, okay, resistances aside, you know, if I did feel fully confident, if, if, if I did feel, feel fully in flow with this, is this still the direction of my excitement or am I lying to myself? And if the answer is yes, then I know the resistance I'm experiencing is just my own insecurities and there's ways of dancing with that. There's ways of mastering your emotions, so to speak, so that you can flow better and bump up against less resistance. Now, on the flip side, if you told yourself that you have to do something because you thought it was a good idea, but you didn't necessarily check if it sparks your excitement, if it, if it sparks your soul or your heart in some way, but you just, you were convinced it was a good idea. You know, this is what I call uh, reasons versus resonance. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, were, if you were given lots of good reasons to go back to school, let's say, but it didn't necessarily resonate with you, but you were just kind of convinced. And now you're experiencing all kinds of resistance and you're having a hard time doing, doing it. But even as you imagine yourself getting to the point, you still don't feel excited. Well, that's a clue that your alignment is off. It's interesting. Your face was kind of making this like yuck expression as you were kind of going through that like resistance piece of, okay, if I'm, you know, almost forcing <laughs> myself, it's going to be like this yucky feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I don't believe in forcing anything. You know, there's, there's that quote that says, um, when it's you, it's forced. When it's God, it flows. When it's you, you know, it's forced. It's when it's God, it flows. Yeah, there's absolutely nothing that I've created in my life. I've been on this path, living this way since I was 21. I'm 36 now. There's nothing that I've created in my life that's come from force, that's come from stress, that's come from frustration, nothing. And you could ask the people who are closest to me, it's all come from play, from passion, from joy. And I've built up a pretty nice lifestyle. So I could stand as an example of, you know, where wealth meets ease while you know, living the fullness of my spirituality. And you're still alive. You're still thriving. So <laughs> <laughs> still doing well. <laughs> All good. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. So then this is, this is interesting because in the beginning of this, you brought up how your mother was like helping nurture these, let's say gifts, these insights, these uh, mystical, these magical abilities that you had, or and maybe not even the magical abilities, but even just your pursuit of happiness and being in that yes. state of happiness. How was it then that, trying to think of how to articulate this because it it almost feels as like in the research I've done of you and like seen and now what you're saying it it seems like at some point this would have been cut off like this intuitive magic that you had and then you know like you said it wasn't until you're 21 maybe that you had like a spiritual awakening so how in your opinion do you feel like that I hate to say cut off because it doesn't feel right but mm -hmm. how did this separation kind of occur you know in a way, I both didn't go through a cutoff and I did, you know, and I could say that looking back now. And so I'll explain what I mean. You know, my spiritual awakening was at 25. Um, I, I, but I, I just started living my passions at 21. Um, so the place where there was a quote unquote cutoff was when I started performing magic for others at 21. I saw it as my opportunity because, you know, I just, I wanted to fit in. I just wanted to belong. And I saw that the people who had popularity, they were a certain way. They were more macho. They talked a certain lingo, you know, there was a certain character. So I thought in my mind at the time that, you know, once I started performing magic and all kinds of attention started coming to my, my way, that it was finally my opportunity to be like them since being like myself wasn't good enough and that wasn't getting the job done. That was my thinking at the time. So it's not so much that I got cut off. It's that I shifted radio stations in my consciousness. You know, so if, if you imagine, let's just say we have two radio stations in our consciousness. There's who we truly are and who we think we need to be. When we go into that station of what you might call your ego, of who you think you need to be, it can seem like you're cut off from the things that are already there on that other radio dial 
in your in your consciousness. So that was my beginning of um, getting cut off and you know getting lost in the ego and you know start I started to reach high amounts of success but not fulfillment. You know because no matter because I kept feeding the character I'd become but but the true me wasn't actually being seen or getting nourished or or living its fullest fully expressed life. And so so yeah, so I forgot for a long period of time that I had certain you know, I don't want to say that I forgot that I had certain gifts and abilities because I didn't know that I had them to begin with. You know, I was born very clairvoyant. I I I saw things that other people didn't see and I played with in energetic worlds and stuff like that, but I didn't know to talk about it because I didn't know it was a unique thing. I, I just, you know, you breathe, I breathe, I see into other dimensions, you see into other, that's, that's yeah. kind of how, it, <laughs> that's how I thought. And so it wasn't until I was 25, um, you know, one of the catalysts to my awakening was actually performing for Drake. I, it was, it was the biggest dream I was able to imagine for myself. You know, I just wanted to be the most world famous magician and I achieved my biggest dream. I, I performed for Drake, blew his mind. He gave me a shout out on camera and, you know, shook my hand, told me I'm going to go far in life. And I thought that now that this happened, now that I achieved my biggest dream, I will have reached fulfillment, this thing I had been chasing to fill this void. Mm. And when the next day rolled around thinking that my phone is going to be blowing up and stuff, it was just another day. And I actually never felt more empty than that day in my entire life because now I had nothing to fill it with. I had achieved my biggest dreams. And so it was through that moment that it was a catalyst for me to ask a bigger question, which was, it was like a moment with life where I was just like, what am I not seeing? Because it's not, what am I not doing? Everything I was doing, I was accomplishing. It's what am I not seeing? And that opened up the doors of synchronicity, so to speak, and started to introduce to me these spiritual concepts, starting with these ancient Egyptian teachings, where eventually, after a year went by of me kind of diving into spirituality and understanding what that world was, I ended up meeting my first spiritual mentor who reminded me that of who I truly was. And, you know, he, he gave me this channeling experience at a time where I didn't know what channeling was or didn't even believe in channeling or energy healing or any of those things. And he gave me this experience where he was just like, you think you're this macho, impressive magician who's a celebrity and gets girls and da, 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 da. But really, the real you is, is sensitive and, and soft and wants to help people and has similar gifts and abilities like me inside. And I had no idea what he was talking about as far as gifts and abilities. But what he most gave me in that moment was this feeling of resonance because I forgot about that true me that wanted to help people that didn't need to be macho all the time and all that stuff. And so it was in that moment that I felt reconnected, if you want to call it that, to that true essence so that I, I finally felt fulfillment. It was my first taste of fulfillment. I'm like, okay, now I'm on the path. And that's where it started to unravel and then gifts started to come back online and stuff. That's pretty cool. And the irony that's kind of sticking out at me is how you, I mean, arguably, whether you want to say, and maybe it wasn't in financial or numeric terms, but I mean, performing for Drake and then, you know, being at that point. And I mean, that, that feels like if anyone's doing anything for Drake, that feels like you're kind of rough near the, the top of the pinnacle of whatever it is that you're doing. And so I find it kind of funny that you've hit this, we'll say pinnacle within magic, which in our concrete reality is a little bit more like sleight of hand mm -hmm. and then are now in this world of maybe even deeper magic, if you will. Yeah. I, I feel like I went from being an illusionist to discovering the real magic of life. Interesting. Okay. So that's probably a better termination would be like the illusionist, right? That would be like your yes. street magic performance. Yes. <sighs> that's pretty crazy. So illusionist, <laughs> because the other thing that similarities come to mind is that, you know, people argue that almost this is an illusion of itself, right? I mean, yep. I don't know how to dive into that given this conversation, but I mean, cause it, cause there is an element of it that this is real, right? Like there is, we are having this conversation, right? Like I'm not crazy, yep. but, <laughs> uh, 
but there is that also element of this just being kind of like this playground or like having fun with it, which I'm sure is another thing that you have to bring into your street magic, your illusionist realm to make it entertaining and for people to enjoy it as well. Oh, totally. You know, for me, when I think of the word illusion, you know, it comes from the, um, the Latin word uh, or it might be Greek word. I might make a mistake there, but it's, it comes, comes from an ancient meaning, which means uh, eludery, which means to play. You know, it's, it's a way of playing with reality. Whoa. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're putting on a play of what's happening. You know, so when I'm taking a card and making it vanish from my hand and appear in your pocket, let's say, the experience that you're having of the card teleported from my hand to your pocket, which is the illusion, the experience is different than the mechanism or the trick that's allowing for that experience to happen. So the experience is the illusion, so to speak. We're experiencing this physical reality illusion and we're like, whoa, this feels so real. But the mechanism that's allowing for this physical experience, that's where we start to look at the, the, the science magic or the real magic of it all, the nitty gritty. Mm. And that's kind of, I guess, then where the science comes into play with this and kind of <sighs> becomes almost this like logical tool of explanation, if you will, for why things are happening the way they are. Right. There's, and, and I feel like there's the scientific portion and also the mystery, because there's always that realm of, I don't know. There's always like, yeah, I can explain it to a degree and it'll make sense and it'll resonate. You know, I might say like, yeah, this reality is like a dream. And that's a fair metaphor, I believe, you know, this, you know, when this reality is like a dream and perhaps when you, when you die, there's been lots of evidence and cases to say that it's a lot like waking up from a dream and you wake up to the totality of who you are. And even with that kind of analogy that could make sense and, you know, and maybe there are scientific things that can complement that there's still that nugget of mystery that, you know, like you can never actually concretize it and say, this is it. Right. Yeah. I mean, and even, even dreams trip me out because, you know, the complexity of dreams that I've had, cause I've been diving more into my dream state, dream realm, lucid dreaming, all that stuff. And I certainly can see how, I mean, fuck, however you want to prioritize or say that dreams are, I mean, it seems to me that they might just be multi or different realities that we're tapping into. I'm sure different people have different perspectives on that, but that's what always like, I found so fascinating. It was like, okay, like this, someone could easily just kind of tap into this dream realm, if you will. Like someone could easily, like, or not someone, I guess, but my, a different version of myself could tap into this version of Clayton. And then this all would just be a dream to that version. And then everything would be weird as fuck. And he'd be freaking out because he's talking to David Lyon. And in that other realm, maybe David Lyon actually kept pursuing his magic career and surpass David Blaine, if you will, in the realms of magic. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. I always, I find that such a fascinating kind of, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's weird. Do you, do you feel like dreams are parallel universes or would, where have you gotten with dreams? Have you channeled anything about them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, for me, I mean, there's different levels and layers of dreams. You know, sometimes you go into the astral realm, you know, a lot of times my, experience is that you're you're waking up you know you're plugging back into spirit you know that's why we need dreams we need to have deep sleep in order to feel rejuvenated right we we, we need to plug back into our fullest nature our fullest energy so that we can come back into the waking world which is also you know from my perspective or from another perspective is sleep you know so mm. We, we come back here so we could have enough energy to to do our things and then we need to go back in right so in a way it's a fun perspective to play with that when you think you're going to sleep you're actually waking up and when you think you're waking up you're actually going to sleep you know it it, it makes me think of hypnosis you know so i've been a hypnotist since 2008 um got hypnotized by a 12 year old boy became a hypnotist. I learned the world's fa fastest hypnosis techniques and I became obsessed with this thing that didn't make any sense to me at the time where I could go up to someone, look at them a certain way, pull their arms, snap my fingers, and all of a sudden they're in this deep trance and my words are becoming the reality. Like, what? 
like when you actually think about that and you, and you get past, you know, because the first hump that people will move past is, is hypnosis real? And once you discover that it is very real, 100%, and that you could learn how to do it very, very easily, then you start asking bigger questions. Because I was going up to people in the streets and in the mall and strangers and stuff, and I would drop them into these deep trances, you know, I'd introduce myself and build rapport very quickly, drop them into trances, and then have them do these things like believe that I was their fa favorite celebrity or make them forget their name, believe that I was invisible and they can't see me and now I'm lifting things up and they think it's floating. You know, when I'm doing experiences like that, it just, it shows you how malleable reality is. You know, if, if you can go into the dream state and in that dream, you wholeheartedly believe you're that person in the dream and that what you're experiencing is real. There's no part of you that questions that reality and, unless you become lucid in the dream. But for the most part, you, you don't really question what's going on there. Even if there's monsters, even if you're flying and changing scenes, that's your reality. And then you wake up over here. Who's to say it's not a similar experience, right? If, if, if I can go up to you or I can go up to anyone and make you forget your own name in a matter of seconds to where you can't say your own name, what else are you forgetting, right? What else has been hypnotized in your consciousness that you might not be remembering? And so that's kind of been a fascination of mine for, I want to say all my life is piercing through those veils of amnesia and considering that there's a lot that we've forgotten. And just by having that intention and inspiration, you start to pierce through those veils and remember more and more through synchronicity. So I was going to ask, how do we remember? And it sounds like synchronicity, was that your pathway or is that the pathway that majority of people can take into remembering? I would say it's a twofold answer because synchronicity is more the organizing principle in the sense that it's synchronicity that places things at the right place at the right time for you to go, oh, I didn't know I needed that. Oh, I just was, I was just reading about hypnosis and now there's a hypnotist at the coffee shop over here right? It's, it's the organizing principle of our reality. But the thing that attunes us to that synchronicity so that we, we experience that unfolding, I would say is twofold. One, it's an utter devotion to being embodied in your truth, the truth of who you are. This is who I am. This is what I believe in. I'm going to live, I'm going to be who I truly am, not who I think I need to be. There needs to be a certain level of devotion to truth, which also means, you know, the way that you are right here right now is no different than the way you are with your family, no different than the way you are with your colleagues, no di different than at work. You're, you're embodying your truth. You're choosing to show up as the true you as much as possible because the more you devote yourself and embody your truth, the more truth gets revealed to you. So that's just a, a frequency mm. that starts to amplify that kind of synchronicity. So step one is definitely having just um what's the word i'm looking for an unshakable devotion towards truth and then from there it's wholeheartedly acting on your highest excitements and inspirations in every single moment that you can and the reason why is because those energies that which we call excitement inspiration joy those things that spark us up that's quite literally the language of our higher self, the language of source energy, if you prefer to use that, that term. And you know this to be true because when you act on those energies and you do choose to wholeheartedly give, give yourself to those energies, you feel like more of yourself. So if, if your higher self was the, the butterfly to your caterpillar, you'll notice that when you act on your inspirations and joys, you feel like more of a full-fledged being. And so you start to tune into where things are figured out for you through the streams of inspiration and excitement and intuition, rather than you needing to figure everything out yourself. And so it becomes a guiding force in your life where every moment that I live, literally, as I'm even just walking around my house, I'm just constantly attuning of like, what's the next spark? What's the next spark? And it might be call this person, get back to this person go do groceries, go do this. You know, my, my, my highest excitement isn't necessarily always project or purpose based. It's, it's literally everything. It's all aspects of my life, but it guides me so that I don't have to think. 
And that just unfolds reality in a certain kind of way, because as you act on excitement, you're receiving more light. Mm -hmm. And what I mean, what I mean by that is imagine that everyone is a rainbow, but most people are only embodied in two colors of the rainbow, which means they only have a two color perspective on reality and a two color per intuitive perspective. You know, they're just seeing certain things, got to work, got to grind. They're not looking at their dreams. They're not looking at anything beyond that. Well, the more you act on, you live your truth and you act on your excitement and all those kinds of feelings, you're receiving and embodying more light. You're becoming more of your higher self. And so you're embodying more colors of your rainbow. So you start to become aware of more of the colors of reality that were always there that you just weren't attuned to. I feel like a, a really interesting, there's a lot of things that are really interesting about that. But one that I think really is pointing and sticking out at me is, is the idea of acting on whatever is, let's say that spark at this given moment. And I think what's probably tripped me up and maybe this trips up most people is say it's something along the lines of like asking somebody out. Right. And you get this, you get this in, in download and it's like, Hey, you know, call up uh, Alessandra and invite her out to dinner. You call her up, you invite her out and she says no. And then we have a tendency because it wasn't our desired outcome to now no longer follow that guidance because we're like, Oh, well, this is, this is bullshit. Like the last time you told me to do this, it didn't work out. So why should I? Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like the importance or the, the thing that we should really cement in there is what feels like the highest alignment in the moment, not what is going to generate the outcome I desire? Does that make sense? Like, like being Spot, unattached yeah. to the desire? Spot on. I would say that. So there's, there's two things I want to speak into here. And you spoke to one of them. One is, is recognizing that your highest excitement, those sparks, they aren't emotional. There's no emotion attached to it. So this is where it takes radical self-honesty and discernment to recognize like, is, is it just your emotionality or even sexual energy creating a spark of excitement to reach out to Alexandra or whatever it is. And it's, mm. it's kind of, you know, it's being swayed by emotions or is it really a neutral spark? Like, is it coming from a place of neutrality and centeredness? And it's like, Oh, this is just the next highest inspiration and thing. So that's, that's one thing to pay attention to. This is where we're getting into the mastery of it all. Um, Cause in, you know, in every simplicity, there's a richness and that's, that's the mastery. And so, yeah, so that's one. And two is the thing that you just brought up is the purpose of acting on your highest excitement is to do it for its own sake, to do it because it feels good, because it lights you up, because it connects you to yourself and because it puts you in flow, not to do it because you have an insistence on a particular outcome. It's because if you have an insistence or an expectation of a particular outcome, then you can disappoint yourself. So it's not the excitement disappointing you, it's the mindset that can lead to disappointment where, you know, let's say, for example, you have an inspiration to, I don't know, um, uh, put on a certain event. And so you follow the inspiration and then you, you get really good at learning how to throw an event and then you do the event and nobody shows up or it, it's you, you don't make any profit. Well, from the heavy or disempowered perspective, you might say, oh, this doesn't work. Excitement isn't the way I, I need to find strategies and work really hard from a more empowered perspective, from a positive perspective, you go, oh, wow. Okay. This really got me to move. This, this taught me the skills I needed and certain things didn't work the way I thought it might, but here's how I can do it better. And what's my next highest excitement? How, you know, how can I flow from there? Because then you start to gather the building blocks so that you can weave your reality with exciting energy while also going through the learning process. Because it, it is like learning how to walk, you know, so there, there's still going to be challenges. You're still going to fall and tumble every now and then, but that could be exciting as well. Yeah. And I think that's a big thing that, I mean, the word non-attachment is definitely coming up into mind. And I think that's probably like really the beautiful thing about it is that you get to a certain point in your life and 25 was about where I found it in my life of having this recognition that you almost see how 
a cascading of events occurs, like transforms into a certain event occurring in your life, if you will, you know, like Mm -hmm. the reason I picked being a software engineer and then going to Florida and you see how kind of that dance occurs throughout your life. And it almost builds this, I mean, this beautiful mosaic or not even really of a mosaic, but more of like a thread that kind of creates your life, if you will, where Mm -hmm. To me, so to me, I didn't, I didn't, I guess I didn't realize it until I was probably 25. Where am I trying to go with this? Oh, just, just that embodiment of realizing like, if it didn't go how I wanted it to, it doesn't mean that that's the, that it's pushing me away from that desired outcome. Correct. More that it's just the, the path that I need. That's the, that's almost like the, the piece of the puzzle that'll get you to the next part of the path. And so do you feel like that's something that needs like life experience to see, or is that something that people could just embody by just, I don't know, embodying it? It takes practice. It definitely takes practice. It takes courage. Cause again, I go back to, to the learning to walk analogy. You know, you, you, it's one thing to know that that is the way it's another thing for your body to have the memory and experience of, Oh, this does work, you know, cause we are physical beings as well. You know, so we do need to experience it or it's helpful to experience it on some level to see like, okay, this works. Now I could refer to past experiences to, sh- to, to show myself this is actually way more fun and easy than doing things, you know, an- another way. You know, it's, it's then doing things through frustration and stress, you know, because, you know, something I always like to remind people of is the feelings that you act on are equal to the reality that you're building towards. So if you're acting on frustration and stress, thinking it's going to lead to happiness and freedom, you're wrong. It it just doesn't work that way until you pivot. Mm. You know, it's, you know, there there has to be a pivot at some point. And that's why we have miserable millionaires. You know, if, if that path really equaled, you know, if doing all the hard work and making the millions and becoming even famous, really equaled happiness and freedom, we wouldn't have celebrities committing suicide. We wouldn't have miserable millionaires. That wouldn't be the case. That's because even if your external circumstances look a certain way, they're still your inner world. And that's that's the first domain of wealth that I like to look at with with people because wealth goes so much beyond financial wealth. It's what's your your emotional wealth? What's your, your mental wealth, your spiritual wealth? So when I say the feelings you act on is the reality you're building towards, what I'm telling you is when you imagine your dream life and how you're living, I guarantee you look fulfilled, you're feeling alive, you're having fun, you're feeling free and all those things, joyful. So if those are the vibrations of where you're looking to get to, regardless of the manifestations, regardless of the amount of money and all that other stuff, but if those are the feelings, well considering that this is a vibrational universe, which we know both on a scientific and a spiritual end, then it makes sense to start moving and acting from those energies first, because it's like, if it's like, if you're, when you're acting on excitement, it's like you're pulling this thread of excitement closer and closer to you and find yourself in more and more exciting realities until you're just like, Whoa, now I have the inner wealth and the outer wealth. Hmm. Yeah. And another thing that was kind of popping up as you were talking about that was the idea of biblically speaking, the idea of heaven and hell. And Mm. I know classically it's kind of projected that like, once you die, you go to either heaven or hell. Personally, I've kind of even looked at the idea of death as a moment to moment basis. Like if you're willing Mm. to die in the moment, then, you know, you can almost sacrifice the last moment for the next, if you will, or you can, transcend your old self and your old way of being into this newer state of being or consciousness or vibration, if you will, or even emotional state. And what I find super fascinating is kind of, I'm hearing that corollary on what you're saying here with the idea of um, moving towards or even create or the emotions that you're acting on. I forget exactly how you worded it. You had a really the nice feelings quote. that you act on. The feelings that you act on is the reality you're building towards. Yes. Yes. The feelings you act on is the reality you're building towards. And I think it fits perfectly with the idea of biblically speaking, when you die, you go to heaven or hell because it's like in every single moment you're dying. So you select, 
okay, do you want to go to heaven in the next moment or do you want to go to hell in the next moment? And you have the active choice of which of that, which of those states you pursue. And it comes through the message of your emotions. Exactly. And this is where I always say, you know, heaven's not a destination. It's a state of being, right? It's a radio station within your consciousness. There are times where you and I and many people, we feel quite heavenly. We're like, this is heaven on earth. I'm feeling in heaven right now. You know, I, I live in heaven every day. It's a state of being. Same thing with our dreams. Our dreams are not a destination. It's a state of being. So it, it is a new way of, or a remembered way of looking at things, you know, because we're, we're remembering to look at things a little bit more vibrationally and a little less physically, a little less concretely, just because that's the way the structure of existence works. That's the, and that's, that's our nature is to be more vibrational. You know, Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, we're, we're human beings, not human doings. So many people are focused on what do I need to do? Okay, but what do I need to do? What's the strategy? But okay, the marketing, what do I need to do? And that's why there's so much frustration and, and misery and just pain and suffering. But if you're looking at who do I get to be? You know, how would I like to nourish myself? I'd like to nourish my being with joy, with love. You know, there's that Mark Nepo quote that I live my life by. It says, um, the flower doesn't dream of the bee. It blossoms and the bee comes. Mm. And when I hear that, I love it because what I hear in that is, you know, the flower is not there dreaming of the bees of abundance or the bees of money or the bees of clients. It simply focuses on its blossom, on unfolding its beingness. And then it has no choice but to attract those bees of abundance and clients and synchronicity. But it comes through beingness becoming a more full-fledged being and even to expand on that further i mean first of all the nature parallel i mean i even look at this with like trees i remember i was actually just meditating in my yard today and i was looking at my tree and it's it's so fascinating to me of like looking at kind of the process that it goes through where okay in the winter it's going to shed its leaves and then in the summer it's going to like kind of rejuvenate it'll be its growth But like whenever it's cold out, the tree isn't sitting there worrying that summer or spring is going to come. It just kind of accepts that, okay, this is the state that we're in right now. Let's just let it be until the next cycle kind of occurs. And then we'll just move into that whenever it it happens. And I kind of see that in the same, the, the flower quote that you had there. And I wanted to transition this into something but I'm kind of blanking. Do you have something to add on to that? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when we, when we think of stepping into our blossom as that flower, the question then becomes, you know, what are we watering ourselves with? You know, how are we nourishing ourselves? You know, and that's, that's where I come back again to watering ourselves with our inspirations, with our intuitions, with our joys. That is the greatest water and light you can give your flower. Whereas the soil is the soil of your truth the soil Mm. of your authenticity because a seed, a flower seed could have all the potential in the world, but if it's not in the right environment, it simply won't blossom. So it just, it it comes back around full circle. Yeah. And okay. I figured out where I wanted to take this. So where it gets interesting is it seems in like the manifestation community, it's like, you know, begin with the end in mind, almost of being in that vibration before you actually get anything. And it's been, Anytime I've broken down anything that I've ever desired in this physical reality, it all comes back to either safety, security, or like love. It's like, Mm. you know what I mean? Whether it's getting a certain number of downloads on the podcast, whether it's having a certain number in my bank account, whether it's being with like a super hot girl at the core of every single thing, it's like validation. It's like, oh, you want a girlfriend? It's because you're looking for love. It's like, oh, you want $5 million or yeah. 500 million you know, downloads on your podcast? It's like, oh, you want validation. You want security. You want to feel safe. And it's so fascinating because if you do just live in the state that you're talking about, where it's just the state of being, of following your highest fulfillment possible, then it doesn't really matter in a sense, what the external world is going to provide you with. If it is actually, 
going to give your podcast 500 million downloads or just 500 downloads. It, it, it no longer matters to you because you know that you're doing that thing that is going to put you in that optimal state of fulfillment. Exactly. You know, and, and even with that said, I would say that those things are still valid. You know, whether you're, you know, you'd like to get a million downloads on your podcast an example, or as an example, or $5 million or whatever the thing is. I don't think it's about canceling those things out as if you don't have some level of care towards it. I think it's just about not making that the priority. You know, it's, it's kind of like if I'm showing up on the basketball court, I'm showing up to have fun. I'm, I want to have fun and play the game and all the points I get, of course, I want to be the best scorer. You know, but that's extra. My 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 focus isn't on I got to get fifty points this game. It's like it would be super dope if I got fifty points and I'm showing up because I want to play basketball. I want to have fun. Mm, dude, that's that's super powerful because yeah, because I <laughs> I've I've actually been thinking about this a lot recently, which is the idea of like surrendering into just that state of bliss and then actually having external desires. And it's something I brought up in a couple podcasts recently. I know. Uh, you were just on her podcast, Christina, Christina yes. Rice. She, first of all, amazing girl. Always shout out to yeah. Christina. Um, yeah, shout out Christina. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and it's always kind of, I found this like quasi state of like, okay, I needed to surrender to the present moment. But then like kind of what Christina puts out is like, you know, you're the co-creator with this. You can have everything you desire. And I've always kind of found this weird, like, this almost tension inside myself of like, yes, I'm down to surrender, but am I just disempowering myself by giving up these external things? And I believe what you put it out there is perfect. It's on the nail. It's, it's not either or it's, and, but it's just prioritizing which, which one you're putting first. Exactly. You know, I think a good example of this is when I got to that point in my life where I was focused on making money, I used to have a lot of resistance towards money because I could not for the life of me understand how to inspire myself towards a number towards, you know, like I'm inspired by purpose. I'm inspired by service, but I was never really inspired by money. And yet at the same time, I really wanted to live a good life and I wanted to be a millionaire and all these things. So there was a bit of a contradiction going on in my consciousness. You're you're hitting me. You're hitting my life on the nail on the head right now. (laughs) Yeah. And so that was a, a big struggle for me. And I knew there was a way to bridge where wealth meets ease. You know, that, that was a big part of my journey. You know, people would say, you know, at some point, you're eventually going to have to work hard, David. You know, you're going to have to, mm. you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to listen yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, I'm like, I know that's your reality, but I'm choosing not to listen. And so it took me time. And then my big shift happened when I was at this event in San Diego and um, I think this was maybe like 2016 or something around there. And um, it was this event. Um, it was kind of like a mastermind event with a bunch of healers and light workers and coaches who are all making six, six figures um, and up from their services. While at the time, I was charging $150 for a session. You know, and I'm like, I couldn't understand, you know, so these uh, these people they were sen- selling ten thousand dollar packages and stuff. I'm like, I'm like, what the heck is in a ten thousand dollar package? What are people paying ten thousand dollars for? You know, and you know, and I invested it in it myself because I wanted to see. And you know, they say become the client you want to attract. And so you know, I I was exploring and seeing, and I was starting to understand. But then there was this moment that clicked for me because as I was in that room for full of people, I recognized that everyone in there believed in hard work and everyone in there was experiencing as much as they had money they were experiencing a pretty high degree of stress and anxiety and stuff like that in their life where i don't experience any of those things and you know that's why i say you know stress is normal but it's not natural and and so i was looking at i'm like oh interesting so that means that if i become wealthy in a financial way, I could serve as an example for people that it's possible to live and be successful through purely the energies of excitement and joy. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's powerful because I get to be that example. So that means my success is not just for me. My success is for the example of what's possible that other people could do. And when that hit, now I had purpose to make lots of money. 
And then that's when all the, the financial abundance started to come in because I had a much bigger reason than myself to do it, which was to show you could do it through flow. You could do it through joy and you don't ever need to work hard if you don't want to. Let's break down that. Let's break down that moment. I mean, cause don't get me wrong. It sounds like exactly where I'm trying to get to is just to have that financial abundance and through flow. So thank you. First of all, thank yeah. you for showing this possible. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. um, thank you. But even, even deeper, right? Um, I'm, I'm kind of getting this visual again. I fucking love San Diego. I lived there for four years and, <laughs> and what's, what's interesting is you're saying that you're in this spiritual climate, if you will, of all million dollar earners, or I, I think you said six figures, six figure, yeah. six figures. And so were you, were you kind of like actively tapping into the energy of that place? Cause I'm kind of just imagining that it's all very similar people who are going to be on this panel. they all have a lot of money. They all have, uh, some sort of spiritual prestige, if you will. So were you kind of just like passively observing like their energy throughout this or how did you kind of come to that conclusion? So I was invited as a guest um, because I had invested in this coach's $10,000 program back at a time where I only had $2,000 in my bank account, you know, but I was, you know, but I was convinced that by his method of effortlessly enrolling high-end clients that was the tagline how to effortlessly enroll high-end clients Mm. to pay you 10k and above i'm like all right well i want to do that and i remember i was so surprised because when i paid for the program and and i got it i was like okay what is in this and i shit you not the 10k program that i got was powerpoint presentations it was it was just power and they were really good. Like they were like, I, I'm not trying to downplay it. Like it was very great information, but it wasn't him talking on a screen. It wasn't live moments with him. It was pre-recorded PowerPoint res- presentations as far as what to do to, to effortlessly enroll high end clients. And I was like, this is what people are paying 10 K for. I could do better than this. And so that was my moment of like, okay, if people are paying for this, I could give people a way better experience for 10 K or, or whatever. And so that was my first spark. And then that same coach, he had an inspiration to invite me to his event. And it was a, an event of a similar nature. And it was kind of like a seminar, a seminar style, you know, so picture we're in like a kind of like a seminar type room. And, um, and it's just a bunch of coaches there, a bunch of different coaches and marketers, people who are wanting to earn sick figure, sick figures and people who are already there and speaking and teaching. So that's kind of what the, the climate looked like. The, was that, was that the question I was supposed to answer? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was the climate. But then I, I think the next little thing on it was how did you, how did you feel into what was it? This would have been 2016. Mm. So I'm not sure if you're, I think your channel would have probably been open at this point, but like, yeah. how'd you feel into the energy or, or see that there was this element of stress that surrounded everybody? So it being there just represented possibility for me. Cause I didn't, you know, coming from Montreal, I didn't know anybody who was that kind of successful, especially, um, through, you know, in, through spiritual service or helping people with their inner transformations and stuff. Um, I was the most successful person I knew in Montreal. And where over here, it's like I, I saw all these people doing things that I didn't understand. I'm like, you're making that kind of money? Wait, you're making that kind of money? And, and I'm meeting these people and some of them are really cool people. And I was just blown away because it, it just inspired possibility. And I'm the type of dude that like the second I sense a possibility and I'm, and I, and it's there now it's already done. It's, it's just, it's going to take time for you to see it, but it's already done. And so as much as I was inspired by the possibility of, you know, that kind of earning, I also feel into people's emotional state, you know, cause something I always point to when people are looking to hire a mentor is I always say, I'm like, don't just look at what they've achieved successfully don't just look at the money that they've achieved and whatnot look at what they embody you know are they financially successful but stressed because if they are i don't want to learn from you Mm -hmm. you know because you're going to teach me stress right along with because because that's how you got there you know i also care about your emotional success so as i was seeing their financial success in the room 
I really didn't see anyone. I'm just think. Yeah, I really not that I could think of. I really didn't see anyone who was vibrating the way that I love to vibrate. You know, feeling that just radiant heart, radiant shine of joy, and I was just like, "Oh, okay, so this is where I'm unique. This is where I have an opportunity to take this possibility and serve as that example myself, because that's a whole other level of success in my books." Oh, for sure. Oh my gosh, for sure, dude. Anyone, if you're if you can achieve the fulfillment along with like, let's say, the financial numbers, then like, please. <laughs> For sure, right. dude. Nobody, very few people I can imagine are achieving that. And I think the number is probably growing if I had to make a guess, but, you know, probably from the work you're doing as well. And I also find it super interesting. This kind of goes back to earlier whenever we were talking about like the model that our parent kind of sat for, set for us, how we both were taking different perspectives. It's interesting because yes. if I would have went to the same conference, I it might have, it might have, and maybe I'm being a little bit, uh, playing catch 22 here, but it might've occurs me like, Oh shit. Like this is the only way making a hundred grand a year, making six figures at any capacity has to include stress. So where did that come from? Where did that, like, did that just feel like an intuitive download of, Oh no, like I know why I'm here and that's to show people there's another way. I think it's because what I'm unshakable in is my devotion to my excitement. There's nothing, no person, no anything that could rock me off that boat or, or influence me otherwise. And so since that's my highest priority, that's just what I look for naturally. You know, so even being in that room, there's no part of me that would go, okay, so maybe I need to, you know, do things that way. It just doesn't feel good to my body, you know, because again, I prioritize how I feel above what I'm even achieving. Mm. You know, that, that to me, that's the, that's the highest responsibility. Cause again, our bodies optimi- um operate more optimally when we're joyful than miserable. So I, I prioritize how I'm feeling above all else. It's, it's the number one thing. So what are some things then maybe that you would do to help yourself feel good? And I think I saw a video that you did where you were talking about like alchemizing energy, if you will, how do you, if you mm-hmm. are feeling bad or even if you're feeling less than optimal, how do you how do you use that as a as a catalyst for transformation or enlightenment or fulfillment mm. or to feel more blissful in your life? Well, a big part of it is definitely accepting it. You know, not judging it. You know, if you wake up and you're feeling shitty or you get triggered or whatever the the, the story is, you know, because it happens to all of us, you know, myself included. The, f- the first thing that I don't do is try and fix it, solve it or change it. That that's it might be habitual to do that, but it's kind of like I like to imagine that our emotions are like our inner children. And so if you imagine them as our inner children and all of a sudden your inner child starts raging or crying, probably the worst thing you could do is try and fix or change your kid, right? As opposed to just listening and giving it the space to be whatever emotion it needs to be, like, you know, embracing it, you know, uh, not judging it, basically, not resisting it. So in a sense, I'll start with mothering myself. You know, the the mother is the nurturer, right? I'll I'll just, I'll make sure, because there might be out of reactivity parts where I flare up and my, my reactivity wants to like, oh, what's going on? Let me, you know, let me fix this. But I very quickly remind myself like, okay, wait, before anything, before we even look at solutions or any of that stuff, let's love the child that's crying. You know, so I will, for me, what that looks like is softening any tension I might ha- be holding in my body and anywhere where my body's looking to reactively pull away from the emotion I do the opposite. I go into it. And that's a very good practice, you know, because the body will, it'll do one of those. So softening and doing the opposite, which might seem like the scary thing to do, is what starts to accept and embrace the emotion. And now you could just kind of hold it in your heart for a bit. And and whether you want to bring compassion to it, or if you want to allow in the compassion of source, whatever language most does something for you, basically, 
I'll be with it, I'll accept it, and then I'll usually go into expression of some sort. And that and that's my way, you know, whether I have a friend that I call up and be like, yo, this fucked up shit happened and I'm feeling like this. And I, I just being ex- expressed in it for the purpose of liberating myself, for the purpose of moving energy. It's not to bitch and complain. It's it's my intention is very like, I want to express, I want to receive reflections, I, I want to receive support. You know, so that's where I start to, once I've given it the compassion, that's when I go into, okay, let me get some leadership. Let me get some guidance. Let me do something along those lines. Let me journal. Um, journaling is another great tool that I use as well from time to time where if I'm by myself and there's a motion that I don't understand that's causing me issue, after I've accepted it, I will literally call forth that emotion and be, and give it a voice and let it write through my pen. And then have a conversation with it I'll, you know like what are you feeling i'm feeling lonely how can you feel lonely and i'll continue and have a dialogue until it feels fully heard fully felt fully seen and that starts to alchemize it just like you would love on your kids that's super beautiful and that really it was funny because as you were talking it sounded like just giving it a voice was coming through to me and then you said you know almost <laughs> giving it a voice and i was like oh nice that's good <laughs> on the right path here so exactly. So that's, yeah, that's so cool too because you know, like you're saying, it seems like a lot of times it's it feels as though it might be easier to you know kind of resist it, get tight and tighten up and push it away and kind of say no and and I've told people this a lot, but if you've ever kind of like burnt yourself on like a stove or something, if you kind of just like re- your initial thing is to like relax and let it just dissipate. Mm -hmm. majority of the time it like never blisters but if you like sit there and focus against it and like how much it hurts and like try to resist the energy that's whenever kind of the blister forms i don't know if you've ever noticed something like that yeah yeah i was actually um i was training with this martial arts guy the other day who um well training is the wrong word he he was showing me what he does (laughs) and i I wasn't in the dojo not Um, (laughs) yeah no um and he did something, what's the martial arts called? Uh, Sistema, I believe it's called. I haven't heard that one yet. And, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a Russian style of martial art. And he was showing me, like he kept telling me, he's like, he's like, punch me in the stomach. I'm like, what? He's like, punch me in the stomach as hard as you can. I'm like, you sure, bro? He's like, go. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and the first few punches, I still held back because I'm like, yo, I don't want to hurt you, dude. Yeah. And he's like, he's, like, he's like, trust me. He's like, this is what I do. And so then I started to really like go at him and punch him in the stomach. And he was perfectly good with every hit. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, well, right before the impact, I relax. I don't resist. He's like, I, 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 I move with it. And I found that so um, reflective of kind of like what we do with emotions where, you know, sometimes when we feel an emotion, we want to tense up. But if you relax when you feel it, it's a much better experience. Yeah. And this might get a little bit darker here. So trigger warning for people, but I know (laughs) even with like car crashes, if, if someone's like intoxicated and they get into a really bad car accident, they're, and definitely fact check this, but, but I'm pretty sure that their probability of not dying goes up because their, their body kind of goes limp in the, like they're in a relaxed state. So whenever they're, Mm like either making impact with the ground or even if they hit a pole or something, they're in that relaxed state, you know, and and again, this is do not drink and drive. I am not condoning that whatsoever. (laughs) Um, But the crux of it is just like, if you're in that relaxed state, whenever you hit into something, then it's like, it just kind of goes through you. It doesn't actually, you know, sit in any of your organs, right? It's almost like the, you know, if you, if you run into something, it's your body's inability to allow that vibration to move through you. And instead it gets maybe stuck in one of the organs or in a, in a brain. And then that's whenever it, it almost will have the, um, I guess the mismatch of vibration, if you will, that then causes that internal injury with it. It, Right. Exactly. Similar kind of principle. You know, so whether it's that kind of situation or martial arts or it's your kid that's like screaming at you or going through something, resisting it or judging it won't bring you closer to the solution that all that everyone's looking for. Right. And so then what you were laying out was to give it that voice, right? It's like, all right, what do you what are you trying to express to me? And 
And it, it, it seems like there's so much power in that, right? Because if it's if it's just joy, we're like, oh, okay, like I want to feel this. I'll let this energy kind of pass through me and stay here as long as possible. But then whenever those other emotions kind of come in, which feels even weird to say, we just kind of want to just push them down and not give them the voice. And so do you kind of just see through giving them that voice, they work themselves out and there's not really anything else you need to do? For the most part. I mean, it, it really depends on the complexity of the emotion and what's going on. You know, some things, it's, it's not like a one size fits all solution, but it is a combination of mothering and fathering yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, and by mothering, again, I mean, just like the nurturing, the compassion, not trying to solve and, you know, which might, it's, it's like, you know, the mother feels into you. The mother just loves, you know, so you might say something or a person might say something like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pissed off because, you know, this person left me. And I'm like, okay, well, like, how do you, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about the person leaving you and being pissed off? Oh, well, I, you know, I, I just, it makes me feel lonely. Now we've just deepened from pissed off to lonely. We're getting closer to the core. Oh, I see. Yeah, that sucks. You know, like, I definitely feel you on the loneliness. And like, how do you feel about that? Like, how do you feel over there? Just like, well, I just, I just feel like I'm not being heard. You know, and so you start to go beneath the layers as you wonder about how you're feeling around how you're feeling. Mm. And then you start to hear the inner child more clearly. Because the inner child is that innocent voice inside of you that's saying like, I just want to be loved. I just want to be heard. I just want to be seen. I want to be felt. That's usually one of the things, you know, I want to feel safe. It's usually what it comes down to as you drop through the layers of reactivity and emotionality, you get to innocence. You get to this voice of innocence that's just like, I just, I just really want to be heard and I haven't been heard in a long time. Wow. Yeah, I feel you. And I hear you, bro. Like, I hear you. Yeah. And, th- and that moment right there is very healing. And anybody else who has tried this or done this, I know personally I've, you know, three years ago was roughly the time whenever I kind of had my spiritual come on, let's say, and then mixed with it, this like almost like a inner child discussion, if you will. And I know whenever I first did it or whenever I first uh, experienced it, I was like asking my inner child, like all these different questions and he just wasn't talking. Like he was kind of just still like balled up, if you will. And, and it was interesting. And I'm, and I'm giving this information for those of you who maybe I know who might be new to this is that it was such a fascinating paradigm to see this, this kid who still wasn't expressing himself. And, and as I've, gone on with it. And I mean, even at the time I was kind of just like, okay, like I'm here for you if you ever need to talk or want to talk. And throughout the years, he's started talking more. Like whenever I'd ask him questions, you know, he would give more deeper responses as time would kind of move on. And so I mainly just want to offer that to anyone who's feels like Mm. their kid isn't talking to them. They Mm. might not feel safe. And so just make sure you're issuing or giving them that sense of encouragement or safety or that you're there and that you are going to be like listening to them and coming back to them. And also making sure that you're not trying to solve them. Mm. That's, that's what I've seen in a lot of times, in a lot of instances when people's inner child isn't responding to them, it's because subtly on some level, it's like, well, I want to talk to my kids so I could feel better or so, so something could shift, you know? So there's a condition at play. Like justify it. Right. You know, it's like I'm doing this. It's a means to an end. You know, like I'm doing this inner child thing so that I can get out of here so I can feel better. But that doesn't feel good to a kid. You know, to that's that's conditional love, even if it's innocent. You know, so it's only when it's just that true. Like, I actually want to know how you feel. Like, are you OK? Like, what's going on? Then, you know, that vibration, that energy will be felt and, and the inner child will open up more. Yeah. And it seems like maybe it's just one of those things that's a process, but it's, it's also fascinating. And this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, whenever I was saying how only over time, can you see how these things unfold? It's interesting how, you know, I, 
I felt like a kid, you know, the society told me I was a kid whenever I was kind of like under the age of 18, let's say at least. And there's still a piece of me, even to this day, that still kind of feels like a kid. And, you know, the mm-hmm. outside world, you know, there's a number on the age thing. And it's like, I, you know, I don't know. I was like, I still fi- kind of feel like a kid. It's like, it's kind of weird. And then you add in this extra element of kind of like speaking with your inner child and how there's even this dialogue that's progressing, let's say, over the course of the last three years that has become deeper and even more <sighs> connected, if you will, the, mm-hmm. like the, the, the relationship is almost building even more so. And so it's, it's just, it's so fascinating to me how there's all these different, I don't know, viewpoints, if you will, like views of yourself that are also running simultaneously and how they're even progressing on their own timeline. Yeah, this is where I I often say the divine child is the God within. It's it's a very potent statement when we take it in, you know, because we often hear about the divine feminine and the divine masculine. But what about the divine child? Mm. You know, the divine child is the God within. That's the you that's eternally playful, that's eternally in its innocence, that's eternally just silly even, you know. And so when you say you said something along the lines of like, you feel like you, you, you feel like you're always a kid. You know, I feel that too. And I, and I know a lot of people, people feel that, but well, you know, what I refer that to, what I, what I refer that to is in a sense, that's our essence, right? Cause there's a difference between being childlike and being childish, mm. right? Our, our childlike nature, our essence, there's an eternalness to that, right? You, you that, essence that we feel moving through our heart that's childlike in nature it's the same essence that's been there since the day you were born to the to the day you pass on and there's a magic in that there's a magic in that it's unchanging right there's a freedom because your mind changes from clear to confused your emotions change from pleasure to pain your essence is unchanging so the more we can rest in our divine essence, in our divine child, in that childlike spirit and nurture it and cultivate it and move from it and speak from it and express from it and all these things, the more we, in a sense, and I use this word thoughtfully, bypass the storms of life, you know, and I don't mean like spiritual bypassing, but you know, we the more we we just feel centered within the eye of the storm, no matter what emotions are are happening or what's going on in our mind, the more we deepen that connection with our inner child or our divine child, that eternal essence, the more liberated and free we can feel in any circumstance, even when things aren't going ideally. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because you kind of bring up this idea of the divine masculine, divine feminine, and then now this divine child. And because this is something I know I've talked about a lot on, on the podcast, definitely more so the masculine and feminine energy. And I can see how those, I can see, I can feel, I can see and feel (laughs) how these energies are kind of working, how they work in me, right? Whether it's feminine energy or masculine energy. And I find that super interesting that even in this way of speaking about it, you've kind of even divorced out a third element, which is the divine child. So we have a divine mother, a divine father, and then a divine child, almost all within us, if you will, which Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know why it's just, it's kind of this funny visual of like an entire family that I'm almost embodying as just like one person. That's it. Exactly. And then there's the divine elder. If we want to take it that, if we want to take it further. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. I don't know if I'm ready for that one yet. (laughs) Right. You know, so they're they're all just archetypes, you know, but I, I, I really, I like the element of the divine child because it's the center point. Cause that could be the boy or girl, the mother or father, but it's the eternal nature that is complemented by our, you know, our masculine leadership as an example, or our feminine care and nurturing as examples, but it's, it, they're complemented by those things. But, but that's why it's like, I rarely, if ever hear about the divine child. Yeah. I think that's something we should certainly talk about a bit more. 
how do you how do you see this uh maybe divine energies playing out in the physical world like you know if it's a I've always really looked at it in divine masculine and divine feminine. I even had a whole podcast uh, with a friend of mine who lives out in San Diego, um, 046, if anyone's interested, where we actually kind of broke down like the wounded states of divine masculine and divine feminine and society, how it cast it as like toxic masculine, toxic feminine. And we like went down this whole rabbit hole of how it's not a very – proper articulation of the terms if we're going to have a constructive dialogue to go with it so you know and we can go down all the different rabbit holes of how those manifest in the real world but what about the divine child how do you see that the divine child almost manifests itself into the physical or even and it may be a way to even look at it's in the air quotes toxic states of the divine child like how do you kind of see it playing out in relationships or, you know, people's realities? So in its positive nature, the divine child is the joyful one. It's the playful, it's the joyful, it's the excited, it's the magical, right? It's the one that's effortlessly able to tune into spirit guides and spiritual gifts. It's it's that's the divine child. So it shows up as the one who's the most radiant and and sparkly eyed in the room and, you know, can very playfully look at possibilities that's usually how it it shows up in the positive aspect in the negative aspect where it's more childish that's where certain immaturities will come out you know certain just like um like i was seeing in my head like 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 no you know like you know like the 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 where you where where you might self-isolate or push people away or not want to let people in things of that nature. That's kind of like the, the childish or the more immature parts of, of the, of the child. Mm. It's interesting. I'm kind of getting this last night. I had a dream and I think it, I think it might actually tie really well into this, which (sighs) wouldn't be the first time that this has happened. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So with my dreams, I've not put it out on the podcast before, but I will usually like set an intention and I'll say, you know, some question I have for spirit or whatever. And then at night I'll have a dream. I'll write down that dream and then kind of interpret it, what it means to me. And last night, my intention involved around uh, a girl from kind of my past. I mean, she's been in and out of my life, you know, Uh, never always have had sexual tension, but have never had a relationship, a physical relationship with this girl. And I was kind of like, you know, what's the purpose of this, girl keeps like coming out into my reality and the dream that I had was me basically being like on a game show almost think about like kind of Mr. Beast style I'm sure you're familiar with him where yeah yeah and then there was like contestants and it was like elimination and uh you know I was like getting pretty far and then I kind of had like another pivot of the dream where then I was like in the final eight but then it didn't really I kind of like woke up at that point in it And so I kind of wrote Mm. it all down and I remember breaking it apart and I was like, am I playing game? Like, am I playing games with girls? Like that doesn't make sense to me. You know, I, I feel like I'm past my kind of fuck boy phase, if you will. Like I, Mm -hmm. I, I, that doesn't really make sense to me. And then the next download that came in was like, no, you need to embody this game like energy in a different way. And so Mm. when you said childish versus childlike, it, it, it really struck with me where, the child ish is almost this like th- that, that fuck boy phase, if you will, where it's like, you're playing games with girls versus like playing games with girls, as opposed to playing games with girls, if that makes sense. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, and that's, and that, you know, it makes me think of when I think childish, I think of when we say hurt people, hurt people. Mm. Yeah. It's that, you know, where it's like, you'll, you, you'll be spiteful, you'll be manipulative, you'll, you know, and you and you can maybe do it in very clever ways that, you know, make it seem like I just want respect. No, I just want you to consider me, but you're really like pulling people into this trap for lack of a better words. You know, it's, it's, it's the whole hurt people, hurt people. And then the opposite is true. Healed people, heal people. Mm. <sighs> yeah. Got to get more of that healing going on around here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am, I am really interested in, Let's let's make this a little bit more of a mystical conversation now. Let's uh cool. let's switch gears a bit because I switch gears. Let's do yeah, it. Gear switch. Because <laughs> I, I in reading your 
I forget where I was reading this, but I think it was on your website where you were talking about during your spiritual awakening, you had a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? An encounter with a divine being from ancient Egyptian times. And I don't know if you can see over my left shoulder here, but whenever I went to Egypt, Anubis was like, Oh, nice. Huge. Like just like, uh, you know, just coming at me. And I was like, all right, all right, I'm going to get this painting and, uh, hang it up behind me. So, um, before we dive into that, what, like, what was your story? I remember, you know, what was the story with this divine being of Egyptian descent yeah. who I, I guess f- manifested himself in your physical reality? Like what <laughs> well, I was trying to break it apart, but it was, it was like, I was like, I just got to ask him this. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite the story. Um, take, true take, story it, take it from the top. Let's go. <laughs> true. Yeah. I'm glad it's true. Good, good, uh, good asterisk there. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent true story. <laughs> Um, let me see. Take your time. Take a sip of water if you need it. Yeah. I just want to make sure this is really clear. So when, okay. (laughs) When I was going through my awakening journey, so basically after the Drake thing happened and, and then I started to know, wanted to know what am I not seeing? The first thing that fell on my into my lap, actually very literally, like my friend dropped this book in my lap while I was rolling a spliff one day. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, he he d- dropped in my lap this book called The Law of One, oh. the raw material. It's and it's a channeled uh, someone who channels Ra, who's uh, the ancient Egyptian sun god. That was my introduction to spirituality. That was like my quote unquote Bible for lack of a better that's word. A, that's a big one to start off with. Yeah, that's that's where it started for me. And so ancient Egyptian things just had this way of finding its way to, into my life for whatever reason, even though I had no thought around it. And at some point in 2012, so at this point I had I had, had my first awakening in terms of realizing this distinction between who I thought I was and who I truly truly was. And I was starting to experience that some people have mystical gifts, but I was still in the, in the discovery phase and probably skeptical to a certain degree. And at this point in time, I was a teacher at a high school. And one day, one of my co-teachers handed me this, it wasn't even a book, it was um, printed out sheets of paper from a book because this book wasn't around at the time. Um, and I looked at it, I'm like, and it was called the Emerald Tablets of what I thought was pronounced Thoth. And um, T-H-O-T-H. And I was like, what's a Thoth? <laughs> and, and she said, she's like, oh, that's the god of magic and wisdom. I'm like, ooh, I like both those things. <laughs> so I took it home and I started to read through it. I don't even think I got through the whole thing. I think I read maybe like the first two, three chapters, if you will. And I really liked it. I thought it was fascinating. It was interesting. I'm like, oh, this is cool. But I didn't think too much of it. I was just, all right, done. Then one week later, it happened to be my birthday. And as my birthday was coming up, what I really wanted for myself was a cat because I hadn't had a cat since I was six years old because my brother was allergic and I had my first apartment. So I wanted to get a cat. And I happened to share this with a friend who came over. She's like, you know, what are you doing for your birthday? And I'm like, Oh, I'm like, I actually, I want to get myself a cat. And she's like, Oh my God. She's like, don't get a cat. My cat just had kittens. You have to have one of my cats. I was like, all right, cool. And she's like, wait till I get home. I'll send you a picture and you could just see whatever speaks to you. I'm like, all right, cool. She sends me a text message and a picture with a bunch of cats. And one of them really stands out to me. I'm like, Oh, I'm like, which one's that one? What's the orange one? And she writes back. She's like, Oh, that's both. And I was like, what you know i'm like this is not a common name we're no. talking here you know i just heard this name a week ago and now you're telling me this cat's name is thoth and that's the one that i that spoke to me i'm like this is weird and so lo and behold that ends up being the cat i get and still the cat that i have today and um and there's like a whole story around like getting her and there's like a whole magical experience in that dude in let's hear it let's hear it yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Take a side. Take a quick side bridge off it. Yeah. We'll come back to Thoth. So when I went to go pick up my cat, you know, I had to wait. Um, 
well, first I went to just go see Thoth in person. And mind you, she was like a cat lady. Like she had, I want to say at least 15, 20 cats in the house. That's a cat lady and for sure. Yeah. She's like full on cat lady and lots of baby cats and stuff. And I went into the bedroom in her bedroom where the mama cat was there with a whole bunch of kittens. And I just kind of like leaned in and I'm like looking at all the kittens. And all of a sudden, this one kitten comes, crawls out of the bunch, walks right up to me, kind of goes on two feet, puts a paw on my forehead and just goes like this. And I'm like, no, way. which cat is this? And she's like, that's both. <laughs> I'm like, what? I was just so mind blown. It was almost no. like I choose you. It was on your third eye too? Was that where it patted you? Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. I choose you. This is it. And I was like, okay, that's clearly my cat. And then she was like, you know, she, the kitten has to finish um, the weaning before I could take her home. She has to finish the, the milking time with the mom mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So I have to wait, um, I don't remember how long, a couple weeks or a couple months. And then when it came time for me to go pick up Thoth, I went to her house and when I got there, you know, I started like looking around and I think she was on the phone or something. So I was like looking around for Thoth and I couldn't find her. And then she finally gets off the phone. She's like, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, what? She's like, she's like, look in the carrying case by the door. I'm like, okay. And I look at the cat carrier and Thoth is sitting there just sitting and waiting to be carried out. Jeez. And she told me, she's like, Thoth got in there this morning and has not left all day. She knew she was leaving. <laughs> oh my gosh, dude. And I was just like, what is happening? Wow. You know, like, <laughs> so I take Thoth home <sighs> and I call her Thothy. <laughs> <laughs> And when I brought her home, she very much became like a teacher for me in a very unexpected way. Because in my mind, you know, I'm 25 at this point, you know, I thought I'm like, okay, you know, like, cat, you eat when I put food here, you do, you know, like I was, I was controlling without realizing I was controlling. So in the beginning, me and Thoth did not get along. Mm -hmm. I kept trying to control her to like, eat at certain times and do things in certain ways and to, and to stop doing that. And, you know, like I was, I was very controlling and rigid and and angry in certain ways. And so like, we just did not get along. And then at a certain point I learned and I, and I started to recognize, you know, through me caring about having a relationship with her, I went from being, you know, rigid and controlling to being more playful and loosening up and more compassionate. And she started to raise my vibration so I could get into sync with her. And it was almost like she was training me, if I'm being honest. <laughs> it was it was like she was showing with me, like, look, I might seem like I'm in a cat body, but I'm way more advanced than you. <laughs> you know, like, I've been here before. So, <laughs> I've done this many times, you know. And so through syncing up, what I ended up learning is that my cat Thoth coming in my life was... Thoth's way. So I, I want the being that I channel and who showed up, I refer to him as Thoth. Um, cause that's how he introduces himself. Um, I ended up learning that Thoth coming into my life and me receiving the tablets and the cat named Thoth was Thoth's way of leaving a, a little bit of a breadcrumb trail for what was about to happen in my life. And first I needed to get into a high enough vibration to where certain experiences can occur for me. So, so now at this point, um, I'm fast forwarding now to 2015. So between 2012 and 2015, I was living my life. I was developing my spiritual gifts. I was living with my cat Thoth and I had gotten to this point. I was teaching. I had, I had a business at the time called the life center where life stood for, it was an acronym for lessons in finding enlightenment. Love it. And thank you. And at the time, I was teaching other coaches and psychologists and therapists how to access their gifts in in practical ways so that they could help people better. And I had gotten to this point in my journey where I was feeling frustrated because I realized the only things I knew how to teach others was what I was taught. You know, I was taught certain techniques. I was taught certain modalities for accessing guides and your gifts, certain meditations. And I only knew how to teach what I was taught. But I had these people in... I think it was like a six month program and by maybe two months, three months, I ran out of tricks. I ran out of things to teach. Mm. And, 
And so I literally had this day in class where I didn't know what to do. And I had to take the ego hit of being like, I don't know what to share with you guys today. Um, you guys could go home and I'm going to, I got to, I got to just sit with this. And it was such an ego hit. And I remember feeling so frustrated and I was just like, and I asked myself the question, I'm like, how would I have discovered these things if I never met my original mentor? Like now that I know these things are real, how would I have discovered these things on my own? It's a good question. And so that question again, opened up the doors of synchronicity. And I ended up finding myself a week later. Um, it was in September of 2015. So it was about a month out from my birthday. And I was at, at my country place with my girlfriend at the time. And for whatever reason, I, we ended up where we were both meditating. And it wasn't for any particular person purpose. I mean, I think my intention that day was really just to have fun. And I ended up in meditation. And back in those days, I remember when I would meditate, it wasn't necessarily very visual for me. You know, I would more experience through feeling and see and sense through feeling, but it wasn't like very clear visuals. But for whatever reason, at this point in time, when I was meditating, I dropped into such a state where all of a sudden it just became crystal clear, as clear as I'm seeing you right now. And, you know, so it's like almost like a lucid dream. And what I saw was so imagine have you ever seen the the original disney movie for aladdin i have but it has been a while so there's a scene in there where princess jasmine is on her balcony and she's kind of like looking up at the stars that's kind of like how the scene is set so okay that was the that was the scene that i saw it was like it looked like princess jasmine's balcony in this starry sky but instead of jasmine i saw me or a version of me kind of like slouch over the balcony, kind of looking down and out and just kind of doing magical things for fun in the sky. Like, huh, like doing magical, whatever. <laughs> moving and stars around. That, <laughs> moving stars, doing <laughs> magical stuff. And I looked at that version of me. I was like, huh. I'm like, I wonder what aspect of me that is. You know, because I've, you know, I'd, I've done soul retrieval stuff before where you kind of reclaim aspects of you that from traumas and stuff like that. Gotcha. And so I was like, I wonder what aspect of me that is. So I went up to it and, and this is like as clear as I'm seeing you. I'm just like, I'm like, Hey, I'm like, who are you? Like what version of you of, of, of me are you like, like, yeah, who are you? And he was like, it's all good, man. You made your choice. Just go on and live your life. And I was like getting rejected by me. You know, I'm like, no, nah. I'm like, of course I want to know who you are. Like, what's your name? Who are you? He's like, it's, it's cool, man. He's like, you made your choice. Just go on and live your life. And I was like, wait a second. And I looked a little deeper at him. And then I had this memory flash come back. And I was like, wait a second. I'm like, aren't you that aspect of me that when I was a kid and I used to play the floor was lava and I would see that reality or I'd play monsters or I would go into my dream world in a certain way. Like, aren't you that part of me? And he lights up. He's like, you do remember me. I'm like, remember you? Of course. I'm like, bro, you're literally the reason why I got into spirituality because I was trying to figure out how to get that world back because I don't understand why it disappeared. Uh. And, and, he, and he was just like, well, he's like, you abandoned me for your best friend, Danny, when you were five years old because he thought you were weird for the way you would play in your world. So you wanted to fit in with him. And so you abandoned me in order to do so. What? Did that actually happen? Yes. You abandoned Danny? Happened. Oh, wow. No, I, well, I, ban I abandoned you abandon this him aspect for of Danny. To oh, to fit in with Danny. Shit. Yeah. As a five year old, so you don't realize, right? And you don't even remember that, or do you kind of? I When he said it, I remember. Okay. Yeah, when he said it, I remember, but I wouldn't have been conscious of it otherwise. Mm. You know, it, it wasn't something on my mind that I had thought about. And. So I was just like, oh my God, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, I honestly had no idea. I was like, I was a kid, I, but I really had no idea. And I'd literally been looking for you my whole life. I'm like, what's your name? And all of a sudden he turns into this golden ball of light and just says magic. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> That's true if you did. <laughs> you were sober for this, right? <laughs> sober. You're sober, okay. Sober. And then, and then he says... He goes, open your eyes. And I'm like, I'm like, okay. And I open my eyes and still floating there 
is this golden ball of light, magic, talking to me like a best friend I hadn't seen in 20 years, which is very different than, a, you know, anyone who's ever communicated with spirit guides. You know, when you talk with spirit guides, it's generally very short, simple, and direct, right? It's very Q&A, like, what's this? That. Where do I go? There. Right? Yeah. This was a best friend who had his own intelligence, own conversation, own behavior was just like, oh my God, it's been so long. Like, man, I've been wondering and da 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 And just like saying all kinds of things. And I'm just there like, what the fuck is happening right now? <laughs> you know, it's like, and it, it's literally that same aspect of me. Like when we're kids and we, and those worlds are so real, came back to my adult self. And the more I interacted with him and had conversation telepathically, the more I came into this kind of vibrational resonance and, and I start to feel certain clicks happen. And I was like, wait a second. I'm like, if you're real, I'm like, and I started to test him. I'm like, I'm like, what is God? And what is this? And what is that? And he would show me these amazing like analogies and symbols and, and depictions that were just so clear, but also cartoon like that made it very easy to understand. And I was just like, wait a second. I'm like, can I use you for anything? And he, and he was like, said something to the effect of like, well, yeah, he's like, I'm your gifts as a child. You're not going to use your gifts for adult like things. You're going to play the floor is lap. You're going to play monsters, but you could use this for whatever you want. I'm he, I'm your best friend. Basically I'm here to help. And I was like, he's like, try something. I'm like, okay, I want to know about this friend's past life. I see the scene. I see the, the movie. I see the, the full past life. And I even text them at some point to, to check with them. And they're like, Whoa, I saw that on an ayahuasca journey. You know, so I get confirmation. Oh, and so I'm tuning into things now without needing any technique, without needing any tool. Now all I need is my my interest, my genuine interest, my genuine inspiration, That, and then I get plugged in. And I was like, whoa, okay. Well, I'm like, what's our purpose? And he said, to make magic normal again. Because everybody has a magic and most people just have amnesia for it. And our purpose is to make magic normal again. And hence why my movement, my business is called Living Magic. And, and I was like, okay. I'm like, that sounds super exciting. Like, how do we do it? How do we wake up people's magic? And then he points to my girlfriend. And I was like, um, um, he, and yeah, I look at my girlfriend and, and he's like, do you see her magic? And I look at her and I see inside of her, she has this kind of like rose colored ball inside of her. And she's still kind of sitting in meditation. I'm like, yeah. He's like, tell her about it. I'm like, okay. I'm like, uh, uh, Judy, I'm like, can I, can I tell you something? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, this is going to sound weird, but there's this magic ball here talking to me. And <laughs> he said, you have a magic ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, there's a magic ball here. And you know, do you notice how inside of you, there's this magic colored, rose colored ball inside of you? Can you see that? And she was like, yeah, actually. I'm like, talk to it. Just see what happens. And she talks to it and she's just like, whoa. And, she, and, I, and both me and her see it like move from inner body and come up and start becoming active. And now she's having this interaction and her gifts are coming online and stuff without needing tools or techniques. And I was just like, that was it? that's how we wake up people's magic. Like I thought it was going to be some like whole formula and meditation. And here's he's the like, 12 step no. program. Like, that's what, that's what I thought it had to be complicated. But what he revealed to me is like, no, he's like, because now you're embodied in that state just by virtue of me seeing it and speaking into it because I'm speaking truth. It creates a kind of field that it could be perceived. And when people attune to it, kind of like me being a tuning fork, I serve as a, a catalyst for, for that reality. So the same way a joyful person will catalyze joyfulness, a magical person will catalyze magic. And so just by me seeing it and bringing attention to that vibration, it wakes up. And, and so then it was just like, this is how we do it. We're just going to do this everywhere and all the time. And I was like, that's a fucking dope purpose. Well, it is you a dope know. purpose. So it started with that. And now continuing on to Thoth. Hold on real quick before we get to Thoth. I got it. You, yes. yes. oh, so you can't just glance over this. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm curious. I mean, I am curious if you set like an intention going into this meditation, but 
Yeah, I mean, it's so funny you even said tuning fork because in my research, in my deep research of of David Lyon, I did find that you brought that up uh, in your bio as well. And yes, it's interesting because it was like the third time I've heard something like this. The first time was whenever I was talking to someone about Reiki and they were talking about how you need to be in the presence of like a Reiki master to get attuned to Reiki. And then the next time I heard it, I was reading the autobiography of a yogi and they were talking about Kriya yoga and I've scoured the internet for Kriya yoga. And it seems like it's something that you need to be in the presence of a Kriya yoga practitioner to become attuned to. And now this is the third time where you brought up mm. like the tuning fork and like in order to have this magic that you need to be in the presence of someone. So, I, I mean, I, I guess it's a complex question of, well, I guess the simple question is like, how do we all embody this own little magical orb that we have? Or like, do we need to be in your presence to do that? Or is that something that we can meditate on to kind of pull out? You definitely don't need to be in my presence and it helps. Mm. You know, you know, and so the reason I say that is like going back to my analogy of embodying all the colors of your rainbow, you know, because I'm I'm embodied in certain colors of my rainbow that everybody has, my presence, whether it's virtual or in person, is going to stimulate that in you, you know, because it's going to stimulate something in your unconscious and and turn on the lights over there just through hanging out with me or especially if you're in training with me, you know, and, and so this is literally... Uh, why I created opening to channel, which is which maybe you saw on the website as well, was to serve this purpose of helping people turn uh, awaken their magic. And the link will be down below for anyone interested. Uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it'll be. <there. laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So y- you definitely don't need to be in my presence, but it does help to be in the presence of somebody who's already embodying that state, just because it makes it easier. You go faster. You know, this is kind of what the original gurus were for before it became westernized and became like this like superiority thing. You know, the the word guru is um is two Sanskrit words, gu and ru, which um, gu means uh, to dispel and ru means darkness. So it's a dispeller of darkness. And so the original gurus were someone who, who walked that path of darkness inside themselves and turned on the lights of their rainbow, so to speak, so they could see in others how to do things more quickly. Mm. And that's why people originally had gurus. So it's, it's kind of like, that's, it's the same tuning fork principle. So whether it's myself or someone else, it just makes things easier and more fun than trying to figure it out on your own or even just spending that time. And it seems like a part of me is like, at least at where I'm at is like just you being here and putting that state of awareness in me is like something that I like, now I can pursue or look for or figure out how to attune myself to, if you will, like, like, of course. like just having that awareness, it's now like, Oh shit. But so then with you kind of getting to this, was there an intention with that meditation or was this something that kind of just, it was just no. out of nowhere. It was, it was very, I was, I was just meditating, I think cause it was like the end of the evening and I was, probably like a little, not tired, but just kind of rested. And I was at peace. I just remember feeling in a state of just peace and just kind of closing my eyes and just, just naturally drifting inwards kind of thing. So I didn't really have a particular intention, but you know, I did say a week prior that how would I have discovered these things if I hadn't met my mentor, Mm. you know, so that orchestration was already at play. Mm. I gotcha. The question was answered about a week later. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes. That makes sense. And so then it's like, oh, it's this piece of you that you could have shut down or you shut down when you were five years old that you are now bringing back online. And it sounds like we all have within ourselves as well. Everybody has it. Everybody's got a magic. You know, it, it's very much. Have you ever seen the movie Hook? Yeah. With uh, Robin Williams. With Robin Williams. Right. It's like the sequel to Peter Pan. So I love that movie because it's such a great metaphor for the human condition, because in that movie, the movie starts off as a sequel where Peter Pan's all grown up. He's living on earth with Wendy. He's got kids, he's married, he's working. And the world has kind of like tore him up a little bit. He's a little bit more cranky and frustrated and he completely has developed amnesia for Neverland. He forgot about it. Mm. And then all of a sudden Tinkerbell comes back in his life and he's just like, fairies don't exist. What are you? 
And she's like, what are you talking about, Peter? Come, I need your help. I need your help. He's like, she's, he's like, oh, I must be dreaming. And she like knocks him out and brings him to Neverland. And he starts to go through this remembering, this reawakening process of like, he's like, wait, these things do seem familiar, but I'm not grasping it. And there's a moment in the movie where he sees his teddy bear that he had as a kid. And that sparks everything for him. And all of a sudden he becomes the pan again. His magic comes online. He could fly. Right. So he, he remembers that he's the pan. And so it's such a great analogy for the human condition is that everybody's the pan. Everybody's got that magic. There's just a really good chance you have amnesia for it. And amnesia is slightly different than forgetting because it's like, you know, it's amnesia for me is like, it's when you forget something, but then you forget that you forgot. Mm. So it's not, it's not even in your field of awareness at all. And you, and he's like, no, I never had imaginary friends as a kid. No, I never talked to, to uh, other dimensional beings. Or do you just have amnesia for that? <sighs> right. That's, that's the question that we're exploring here. That's a, it's a deep question too. And it seems like that mm. goes pretty deep as well. I even recently yes. was working with a hypnotherapist and they, I mean, long, it's a long story short, but they like had me remember um, back to a time when I was like one years old and it was like through this whole process. And I was like, holy shit, like, you know, I didn't even know that that occurred, you know, and it was like very right. insignificant, but obviously left a very strong imprint that I was still feeling to this day. So yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of truth there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, would, what would be a question or a mantra or a question that you would encourage people to use to maybe bring this magic ball back online for themselves? If they were going to meditate or write? Um, well, I do have a practice on my YouTube channel that people can access at any point. It's literally the exact meditation that I use to turn back on the lights of my spiritual gifts that was passed on to me by my mentor. I'm going to look that up. Um, what do I type in? I believe if you type in David Lyon soul magic, soul it should magic. be the first thing that pops up. Soul. And it's about an hour long live stream. Hour and nine minutes. That's the one. All right, cool. I'll save that for yeah. later. So what's really cool about that is it's a very practical activation experience where what it does is, you know, cause when we're children, most of us, because we're not taught how to deal with certain feelings and things could become overwhelming, at some point we learn to numb ourselves to be able to handle reality. But in order to do that, in order to numb ourselves, we have to numb certain energetic sensors, certain sensitivities in order to not feel certain feelings. So not only are we no longer feeling certain emotions we don't want to feel, but we're also no longer sensing parts of our energetic reality, parts of our rainbow. Mm. And we don't realize that we've done that. So we forget that we did it. And then we forget that we forgot. We get amnesia. What this meditation does is it goes through your body and it resensitizes every part of your body so that anywhere where you may have numbed out, it resensitizes and turns the light back on so that you could re reascend into your higher self senses, if you want to call it that. And it makes it that much more easy to explore your energetic gifts and your intuition and any kind of spiritual practices. Does this, does this come with any asterisks? Like if someone's yes. not ready to see, uh, all right, I'll let you take it away from there. <laughs> yes, there, there is. I'm, I'm happy you brought that up. So this, hmm. when you do this, if you choose to do this, it is best to do this. If you're someone who is genuinely devoted to your growth, genuinely devoted to becoming your fullest, best, highest self. You know, if you're someone who's just trying to keep things the same and you know, you're very comfortable, but you, but you also just want to explore spiritual gifts because of whatever, it might not be the best idea because essentially what you're saying with this meditation is that I want to go back to being my higher self. So let's just imagine that your higher self is represented by my, by this, my I'm making like my spreading out my hands for those who can't see, like making like a high five almost where all throughout life, you learn to compromise yourself and please others and be who you're not. So you start to contort your puzzle piece, you know, and your you hands, your, your hands kind of coming into a fist as you were saying those. Yes, exactly. So as my hands in this kind of contorted shape, you fit with friends that fit that contorted shape work that fits that contorted shape, lovers, so on and so forth. 
doing this meditation is telling your body you want to go back to this. You want to go back to the full spread out hand, the full natural shape of your puzzle piece. So as you do that, it one, it happens very, very rapidly. I mean, that genuinely happens rapidly. And so when you do this, all of a sudden, certain things will no longer resonate and will start to fall out of your life. You know, so if you're holding on to a relationship that really doesn't serve you or work that doesn't serve you, things will happen. Things will shake up because you've made that wish, if you will, to return to your higher self nature. So if you're devoted to growth and you're cool with that, then it's all Gucci. <laughs> but if <laughs> but if not, you might just want to use some awareness. Yeah, it's almost like it's it's going to shine light on dark places. Yes. And, and it's, you know, it's, and it's going to make certain things, certain things can fall out of your life. Damn. I'm really excited to, I'm really excited to get into that. Um, but before I do that, let's, we still haven't, we still haven't gotten to Thoth or thought, yes. Thoth or Thoth. Either one, really. either one, you know, it, I, I've learned it just kind of depends on how you're referring to him and where you're going with that energy. But that's a, that's a, that's another story. I'll, I'll, <laughs> that's a more nuanced I'll, well, the, yeah, that's more nuanced. Well, I'm, I'm interested <laughs> in the uh, Egyptian deity, although it, your cat sounds dope as fuck, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so after this magic experience happened, and by the way, I have lots of other um, videos on my YouTube and even on my Instagram that help with activating your magic and give you practices for communicating with spirit guides if you just kind of want to get tasters of that. But honestly, they're really beyond tasters. They're like really good things that can get you there. It's just not like a full training. Um, just to further answer the magic question you asked, um, to put a so, to put a lid on that, I'll read the full title of this so people are aware. Um, it's Soul Magic slash slash Activate Your Spiritual Gifts Guided Hypnosis. Yes, and it's yeah. it's killing it. It's got like five fifty nine thousand views. So you'll join the join the crew as well on that video. Okay, cool. Just wanted yeah, to put that out well, there to wrap that up and for people to find it. Cool. Thank you. So after my magic woke up in September of 2015, I believe it was around, I, I, I think it was September 29th. I, I don't remember for sure. But shortly after, I happened to be at a marketing workshop. And it wasn't a spiritual marketing workshop. It was just a marketing workshop in my friend's living room. And I was sitting on the couch and there were people sitting on the floor and there was a guy in front of us talking, talking about marketing stuff. This was on October 1st, 2015, 1001. And 10 and 01, they reflect each other, which is significant for other reasons. But <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden, as I was sitting at the marketing workshop, this giant gold body of light shows up to the left of me, which has the head of an ibis, like a bird like head, and just I immediately, like I, I look to my left and I kind of do like a double take. And I was just like, immediately my heart recognized the presence. I'm like, holy shit, that's Thoth. And, and I looked at him and I was just like, and at this point I was used to communicating with spirit guides, you know, my, my magic was there and stuff like that. So this was just another occurrence at this point, but I had not seen Thoth in the physical, you know, like I had spoken with Thoth in meditations and, and and on mushroom journeys and stuff like that, but not like this was different. And I looked at him, I'm like, I'm like, yo, I'm like, what are you doing here? And he's like, keep watching. And I'm like, okay. And I was listening to the presenter speak. And in my head, on some level, I was judging him, you know, because he was, I was judging him because in my head, he wasn't being authentic, you know, because he was talking with a very stone face. He was like, okay, guys, so uh, what we're going to do is a na 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 and But on the inside, I could see he's a real goofy and silly person. So, so I was judging him. Mm. And then Thoth spoke in my head, and he was just like, you know, there's more than one way to be authentic. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, he may not be being his sole personality, but he's speaking from his heart, and that's authentic. And I was like, damn. I'm like, okay, respect. And it felt like giving him props. I was like, you got me on that one. That was good. And wait, help me, help me like, understand that a little bit more. I think you lost me there. Like as in all mm -hmm. of this, he's speaking from his heart, but because of whether it's baggage or trauma, he's being authentic to the trauma, if you will. Is that 
Oh, no, meaning like, um, because I was looking at authenticity in terms of being in being expressed as your soul self, like, if you're a silly person, be a silly person. Okay, you know, but he was saying that regardless of how he's expressing himself, just the fact that he's sharing and speaking from his heart, that's authentic. He wasn't sharing, like mental things, he he was speaking what was genuinely true to his heart. And so that's a form of authenticity as well. Mm, Even though it's not the deepest, let's say, form of truth, it's still the highest form of truth that he has. Is that a better way to articulate it? It's more so that he may not have been saying it from his true personality, but he was saying, you know, whether he was saying it from his true personality or not, it's that same, um, it's the same expression that would have come out. He's still speaking from his, from his heart is the only way I kind of know how to say it. It's like, like, as opposed to like regurgitating knowledge that he heard somewhere else. Like he was, he was saying what he believed in. He was sharing his true values. He was sharing is, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. It wasn't like, I'm just repeating this just to repeat it. I was, he was still, he was being authentic, but it wasn't coming from this bubbly soul level authentic, but it was still soul authentic. Right. right. It was, it was, it was authentic on a level of expression because it was, it was coming from within, but it wasn't authentic in terms of he's not actually that serious. You know, he's, he, you know, he, he, he's, he's got a little bit more humor and giggliness in him and stuff like that. So that that's where I was making the, the distinction. In the mm. moment. Does, yeah. Like you, does that make more sense? Yeah. You were, you were thinking that he should have injected more of that bubbly joyfulness, but it, it, it doesn't mean that he's not being authentic because he's delivering it a certain way. It was just, exactly. it's almost like a, a style that he was choosing to deliver it with, if you will. Exactly. Gotcha. Like he thought he had to be professional and proper with it. And mm. so he, it was coming through that filter. Right. Like I'm not going to go into a business meeting and start, uh, cracking jokes. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know, being a comedian, if you will, I gotcha. Okay. Ig- exactly. Now we're on the exactly. same page. All right, cool. Yes. Cool. Plus one for thought. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> plus one for thought. And so, you know, it was a moment of like, damn respect, like gave him props, uh, energy props and energy props. and so i looked at him and i was like so i'm like so why are you here and he's like we're gonna be working together and that was the start of at least in this lifetime consciously of my channeling journey with thoth and where i started to learn the art of becoming a trance channel and where i would like literally get out of the way and thoth would come through me and speak through me and i and i was learning those dynamics inside my consciousness and what it takes to allow the flow of that energy without getting in the way, without kinking the hose, so to speak. Shit, dude. Yeah. Trans channeling is always a weird, interesting one for me, at least. It always seems like it, it's so bizarre because like when you watch it, you might think that there's some sort of theatrical display, but whenever you almost like feel into the energy of it, you can almost tell that it's coming from somewhere else or something else. Yeah, you, you definitely feel it. You feel it. And you know what I always like to remind people of, because like, you know, even in my in my opening to channel training, it's it's taught by me and Thoth and, and some other people. And, you know, what I always like to remind people of is it doesn't matter if you believe that, you know, is it really Thoth speaking through him or not? It just matters. Is the information useful? Is it applicable? Is it relevant? Does it help you? You know, mm. I, I, and I, I, I find that could be, a, I mean, generally the, the people who I attract to my training don't have that level of, let's say skepticism, but you know, there are definitely people who will, who might see my videos on YouTube where I'm channeling Thoth or something like that and be like, I don't know, you know, well, then it, actually I haven't had those comments, but it's possible. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> they exist. There's people out there. <laughs> it's possible. I was trying to make a point for other people. <laughs> Oh man, dude, that's super cool though. And so do you, do you feel like it was almost like this, this kind of journey to, I mean, obviously it was a journey. That might be a bad way to articulate it. Like whenever you were, I guess I'm trying to view it from my perspective, right? If I'm Mm -hmm. two and a half, three years into my spiritual awakening and like the idea of seeing a deity or entity like beside me seems like cool as shit is the most simplest thing. I mean, it seems like the most simplest thing is just to keep following 
what brings me the most joy and excitement. And if it's in my path to have some sort of deity beside me to talk to, it'll just kind of happen. Mm -hmm. You're, is that, is that a question? Like, will that, yeah, I guess that's a question. <laughs> is it like, is it the simple, is that the simplest form of just continuously pursuing happiness or joy? Is it that simple or is there more to it? I want to make sure I'm understanding correctly here. Are you, yeah. Could you, could you reframe it? Sure. For me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's a uh, quick rewind here. <laughs> I'm viewing it in this light that, so I kind of had my spiritual awakening two and a half ish years ago, three years ago. And, you know, I took a, a open chant, like open my channel seminar, if you will, with a, a girl, mm. shout out uh, Kashik Danny West, if anybody's familiar with her. Mm. Um, and she, well, so like, I've been in the process of like, uh, how did it start off? Like the initiation of it. Oh, like setting the intention and like invoking the channel and everything like that. And I've kind of been trying to step into even just always embodying my channel, if you will. Like that's kind of like the, mm. the phase I'm in, I guess, is like to quote unquote, always be in my channel, always to be receiving divine messages. And I think I'm just about to turn that corner. But the point is, mm. is, it, is that kind of like the progression, if you will, it's like, okay, now that you're in your channel mm. and then like the whole activation of magic, if you will, having your magic ball, and then getting to the point where you're physically seeing other deities, because I know Christina has even talked about where, um, what was it? I think it was like one of the last grand junctions whenever she like literally saw like this whole, her entire room transformed into like this magical seance type thing. And mm -hmm. like my ego is like, holy shit, that sounds cool as fuck. I want to experience that, you know? <laughs> right. Um, so I, yeah, I guess I'm kind of curious from that perspective. Mm -hmm. It's just a part of the process. It's just something as you go deeper down this spiritual rabbit hole. So it can be if it's relevant for you. And I'll speak to this in different ways. What I've noticed is that people who have a natural kind of inclination towards helping others, offering guidance, um, offering clarity, things of that nature, generally will end up having the experience of communicating with guides and other beings of that nature if they choose the spiritual path in that way. That being said, it's not only limited to those kinds of people. Like I know, I know many, like I have my friend Harun, who does not, he's not the type to give guidance. He's actually um, a tech programmer. He, he writes code and, and stuff like that. And he's very connected to those realms. So it's not definitely not limited to, to, to guides. I'm just saying I, I see it most often in that scenario, which is also the playground I play in. So I might be biased there. But that being said, part of revealing it, you know, the more love you have for those other beings, let's call them, you know, for your guides, for angels, or the more love you genuinely feel towards that connection, the more it can be revealed towards you because you're acknowledging and honoring that there's something there. So it starts to open up certain portals in your reality, if you will, that will, that can manifest themselves as seeing beings in your reality or whether you see them in your third eye or in your imagination complex. You know, there's different ways that they can manifest themselves. But at the end of the day, the formula remains the same in terms of act on your highest excitement every moment that you can. And that's the organizing principle of your life that reveals the synchronicities that will lead to those kinds of things. I see what you're saying. It's almost as if it's like each of these dimensions are their own flower, if you will. And it's whichever ones you're going to keep watering, keep giving good soil to, those are the ones that are going to develop, let's say more strongly, if you will. Like if you're constantly working yes. on your podcast, then yeah, it's obviously going to increase in followers. If you're constantly working on your Instagram page, if you're constantly working on your channel, if you're constantly working on, you know, insert whatever your relationship, it's just whatever you're really giving that attention to, that's what's going to expand outward and, and grow. And I guess we, now, do we kind of have, how do you see this? Like, do we have a choice mm -hmm. in which things we give energy to or in the pursuit of our highest, most fulfilling energy will naturally gravitate towards certain things? We, we absolutely have a choice. And at some point it kind of becomes like a choiceless choice. 
you know, because if your orientation is towards your highest good, your highest fulfillment, highest purpose, then there's certain things that you'll naturally choose as it unfolds. You know, if there's whether it's guides, angels or what, you know, whatever it is, it'll it'll kind of become the choiceless choice if you sense that it's in that direction. But I mean, you can absolutely, for example, when when Thoth first came in, at, at first I was channeling Thoth for my girlfriend and then this one other friend, and then I gained the courage to channel for my students at the time at the Life Center. And then Thoth was like, okay, now do an event. And I was like, I'll be back. <laughs> you know, because I had the fear that, well, what if I put together this big event and then I go to say, I'm like, okay, I'm going to channel Thoth and then Thoth doesn't show up. You know, and so it took me five years to act on that guidance, to act on that directive. So you very much have a choice. And I actually went through a period of thinking that like, oh, I, I fucked up, you know, because because I didn't act on it for so long, my connection with Thoth seemingly dissipated. Mm. And I felt and I felt like I, I messed up. He moved on. He left me. And, you know, my abandonment wounds were getting triggered and stuff like that. And it wasn't until I naturally started taking actions towards that type of event of my own volition because I actually wanted to go that way and kind of forgot even about the whole Thoth thing that all of a sudden Thoth came back in and was like, okay, you ready now? <laughs> okay. That's, that's super fascinating. And that makes a lot, a lot of sense too, right? It's like, it's almost like here's the next, the next step in our evolution together, whatever that might be, right? Like, like with my channel, for instance, it's, this is the next step in our evolution is to do whatever it might be. I'm, I'm kind of having a, I'm, I'm not really sure what the next step is. I think it's just like still a trust piece of continuously trusting it. And so it's mm -hmm. almost like if I want to pursue this, your next element is keep trusting, keep trusting, keep trusting for you. I mean, and maybe there's a bit of that trust. I mean, it sounds like fear of just actually taking the initiative on that. And so it's like, you know, what's the thing that's going to quote unquote, stop you from that progression of, of building that yes. connection even deeper. And and do you now looking back on it, right? You said, I think it took you about five years to actually keep pursuing that path. Five years. So did you, do you kind of see it looking back that it was like, there was another way that opened up for you to get there? Or was it just, you weren't comfortable doing it. And then this five year path made you comfortable with that? Like how, how do you kind of see that looking back on it? That's a great question. Um, looking back, you know, I see that it all played out perfectly. I feel like Thoth gave me a heavy weight in the sense of like, you know, gave me a, a hundred pound weight where I was used to lifting 50 pounds mm. and on some level or on all, on all, on all levels, let's <laughs> say he knew that I would take my time with it and that I would go through these insecurities and challenges of building up my confidence. So looking back, I could see that, you know, it was all it was all part of the, the plan, so to speak. Like there was nothing, I don't feel like anything was missed or anything could have happened sooner or anything like that. It feels like I was working my muscles to get to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm ready to lift a hundred pounds. Gotcha. And so, okay. So he was kind of like, I was, I was getting this, I, I'm, I'm blanking here a little bit because I started getting this other visual in regards to like money. If someone has like a money wound and they're being told that they need to buy a hundred thousand dollar lottery ticket, if you will. And yet they buy it and then it doesn't give them anything. It's almost, it's almost like exercising that trust, if you will, in the information you're giving is what helps them to expand their, expand their, like, I, I, I want to say control, but control doesn't seem like the right word their imprint in this reality. Yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. You know, I, I feel like the thing that gets strengthened is your, your why, your reason why you're doing it. You know, like, so let's say in the money example, you know, so uh, they might be encouraged to, you know, go buy a lottery ticket or to show up in a certain way. I could see that as an exercise in embodying the wealth of your spirit. How much could you show up in that positive, vibrant state and, and emanate a wealthy kind of frequency, regardless of what happens in your reality? 
regardless of if it doesn't go as you expected. You know, so I could, I could, I see it as like an exercise. I, I you know, and, and then at a certain point, your why goes from, well, I just want to win the lottery to, I just want to be wealth. I want to represent an example of being wealth. And because now I've let go of wanting to win the lottery, now I'm attracting lottery like earnings. Gotcha. Yeah, it's always interesting how like that that lack of desire for the outcome almost like brings it in like five or tenfold, which is pretty crazy. Right. And and that's why, like, you know, even in my own life, I do everything for the fun of it. You know, like I, I really, you know, I, it's either fun or service. Like, I, you know, like here in this moment, my intention, my desire, my devotion is purely to be of service. You know, how it goes, how it lands, is, it's out of my hands. You know, but I, but I, I could absolutely show up to my intention. Yeah, I can certainly, I certainly, it's weird. I, I can't even honestly say it. Cause I still feel like there's a piece of me that is probably still in that ego state of like doing this for the validation, right? Doing this for money on the other end of it. I still, I, I can't sit here and I think honestly tell you that I am a hundred percent purely I don't know because I'm a hundred percent purely sitting here having this conversation with you, having all the conversations I've had out of genuine curiosity for the way that you and others see this world, the way that we interact with it. So do you think that there's a level that I myself or anyone else really needs to get to this place of 100% only doing it because it helps other people as opposed to seeing the, results that are a byproduct of such a thing does that make sense i feel like that's a natural part of the evolution process where you as you get to the part the point where you're feeling so fulfilled and joyful in your own beingness you naturally want to outpour you naturally want to give and you and you naturally don't feel like you need as much from a from a lack perspective you know it's it's you know so but it is a process, you know, and that's where I was saying earlier, it's perfectly okay if you're doing it for validation or for downloads or whatnot and go beyond that. It's like, yes, I would love this. Yes, I'd love the validation. And I'm doing it because I want to give people the best experience ever. I want to blow people's minds. I want to, you know, so it's, it's yes. And it's right. go beyond it. Go beyond it. Gotcha. It's, it's setting that priority list of like, all right, this is the number one. The number one is Honestly, my number one is connecting with other people. So maybe I need to figure out a way to kind of play with that. But but I, I guess the number one really is, it's like, <sighs> see, that's what's interesting, right? And this kind of comes back to the idea of separation where in my mind, it's like, if I'm purely coming at this from a place of curiosity and seeing like how you see this stuff, I mean, you've dropped so much wisdom throughout this just two hours already. It's incredible first of all thank you you're like i'll thank you on behalf of the audience and myself and so thank you and so i think like because it, it's almost like i i selfishly started this right because i said i i want to say that i selfishly started it because i i looked at like joe rogan for instance and i was like dude i find it the coolest thing in the world that he could literally call up 99.999 percent of the population and be like yo i want to have a conversation with you like yeah. that was my motivating factor for this entire thing to be able to have something where I'm like, Oh, David Lyon, like look at all this cool shit he's doing. Like I literally want to talk to the person that see how his life unfolded that got him to where he is today. And so it's, it's this weird catch 22 of like, I, I see the selfishness in that of like, I want to talk to anybody, but then at the same time, it's like, look how much information and wisdom he brought to me and the audience. I don't see that as selfish at all. Actually, no. I, I see the I see the I see the pure inspiration in that. You know, that's kind of it's almost like a kid who's like, I want ice cream. I want that ice cream, right? It's not selfishness. You know, maybe it's considerate of the self, but in in the way that selfishness is generally meant, that vibration, it's not that. It's it's pure desire. It's pure inspiration. It's the divine child. Mm. Right. So, so I actually think it's a beautiful, I think it's a beautiful intention when you said like, I just want to be able to connect with people. To me, that's, that is the highest, you know, that because it's, because it's pure, because it's pure inspiration and that's coming from your joy, that's coming from your inner child. That's the, that's the service. That's the magic. 
you're making me feel like I need to have some, I think I have some inner child stuff I need to look at <laughs> <laughs> around selfishness. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's so funny about to, to talk about selfishness for a bit. I remember I went through a selfishness chapter because I wanted to understand it. I used to, when I was just living in Montreal, before I had ever ventured off to LA, I was my understanding was it's best to be selfless, you know, at selfless service. And I was really good at it, but it felt unbalanced in some way because there were as much as I was helping others and improving other people's lives, like my life wasn't really progressing in, in the, in things that I wanted for myself. And so when I did go to LA for the first time, part of my intention was, was, well, one, is I wanted to get away from the winter time. I wanted to be in a completely different environment. And to me, LA, I knew nobody. Like it was purely intuitive to go to LA. Like I knew it could have said go to Alaska. That that's what LA was for me. Mm. And so I was excited for the adventure and I wanted to see what I was capable of if you dropped me in an unknown place and all I had was my potential. I was like, I'm not gonna get a hotel. I'm not I'm only going I went there with four hundred dollars to my name. Like and I was just like, got a one-way ticket. I'm like, what can I accomplish with just my potential? And my other intention was, I want to explore being selfish. I want to see what selfishness actually is because I, I've had so much resistance to it and it feels easier to explore where nobody knows me, where I have like a blank canvas. And I remember when I was there in LA and I was exploring it, I loved it. You know, I was being selfish in a sense of only doing what I wanted for me. And since I didn't know anyone and I didn't have any clients there or something like there was only me and me. So it was very easy to be selfish, so to speak, considerate of myself. And, you know, I did what I wanted. I uh, it's basically lots of doing what I want and, and thinking only of myself. And then at some point I got to the extreme. And that's something that I like to do. That's how I grow myself is. I don't just kind of inch towards something. I'm going to take it to the extreme until I find that line that's like, okay, that's, that's where I don't want to go beyond. And so I did that with selfishness and I got to the extreme where all of a sudden I noticed that all I was thinking about was money. And I was like, mm. I'm like, yeah, I don't like the feeling of this. And so I, I stopped and like, ah, I'm like, okay. So, so selflessness has its flaws for lack of a better word. Selfishness has its flaws. I'm like, and what is it? And then one day I was in the mirror, I was brushing my teeth and I was reflecting on this and I asked for one of my spirit guides to come Pun in. intended. <laughs> <laughs> what did I say? You, were, you I said I was, in the, I was in the mirror and I was reflecting on this. Oh. <laughs> I didn't even notice. <laughs> um, I was brushing my teeth and I was reflecting on this and <laughs> in the mirror. <laughs> in the mirror. <laughs> And I asked for one of my spirit guides to come in and the spirit guide that came in, I remember was like, it kind of looked like this ref a, a body of uh, galaxies and stars. It was a very particular guide at the time. Um, and I remember I looked at it and I was like, are you selfish? And it was like, nope. I'm like, are you selfless? It was like, nope. I'm like, then what are you? And it was just like self. <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> it was so simple yet so profound oh my god i was like i'm like that makes so much sense and I, I literally saw like the image of the sun of how the sun you know both gives and receives you know it, it has that magnetic force where it's receiving whatever waves but it's also giving life to the whole planet you know so it's, mm. it's just self shit dude i got some inner work i need to do with that <laughs> I definitely was called selfish one too many times as a kid. I don't know where, but I can just feel it. <laughs> uh, I can feel that somewhere. I don't know where it is. I don't know where it is, but we'll find it. <laughs> we'll see where that little bugger's hanging out. Yeah, it's a good oh, one. Oh, man, dude. I don't have anything else. This feels pretty complete. <laughs> I want to go meditate. Cool. That's why <laughs> That's why my mind's like, dude, go figure out this selfish shit. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then... Do so playfully. Playfully. And do it playfully. Go discover that magic. Yeah. Anything we do playfully, a lot more will be revealed than if we do it seriously. 
but that's crazy too. because like, I've seen all these, like just kind of having like a playful day. I've seen so many more synchronicities that kind of flow in. Yep. And that's a hundred percent. So I call this the vacation vibration where Say you know, again, something the vacation that, vibration, the vacation okay. vibration. Yes. You know, so something I always say and something that my dad says as well is life is a vacation. You know, a lot of people say life's a bitch or life is, I'm like, life is a vacation. And, you know, we're here to have fun. And what I love about that statement is you ever notice how when you go on vacation, you when you show up, all of a sudden it's like there's this flow that happens. You're in such a good state because you're on vacation and all of a sudden your room gets upgraded and then you meet these people and, you know, you just have the best time of your life that you didn't expect. What I love about that is that didn't happen because you went and traveled to wherever you traveled to. That happened because you gave yourself permission to treat life as a vacation. Yes. And so you step into the vacation vibration, which is having fun. And all of a sudden, synchronicities happen. Freedom happens because you're letting yourself play in that state of being. So that's why I say life is vacation. I love that. And it even, even in that, you are like, it's almost as if you're more in this yes energy of listening to what the universe is providing you with. And you don't have this resistance to you know, maybe it's someone who you think is going to take from you or you don't have this resistance towards, you know, what the negative outcomes of it could be. And therefore you're, you're saying more yes to the synchronicities and the way that the universe is kind of bringing things to you. Exactly. Exactly. I just, where I say, you know, my, your, your intuition and your inspiration are your fork and knife on the dinner plate of life. That's a good one. <laughs> right. Those, those are the only two tools you really need. You know, your, your excitement and your joy is your volume. It's your vibe. That's what connects you to more intuitions and inspirations. But your only real two tools that you need are your intuitions and your inspirations. You know, if you, if you pay attention to those magical shit will happen. I mean, and I, I tell people this all the time and I have even told my audience this all the time that like I've started doing a little bit more preparing for guests, but like generally speaking, like there's no, there's no notes, like there's no anything that's all pretty much just you talk and I listen and I literally just like listen to my intuition for the next question or um you know if it's time to wrap up the podcast or anything and and it's always kind of funny because people will always like reach out to me of like like if I invite someone on they'll be like oh what do you want to talk about and I'm like I I don't know (laughs) like like to be like whatever comes up I just want to talk to you (laughs) like I don't yeah it's like okay you're a channel you're a mystic like we'll probably talk about something in that ballpark you know (laughs) it's like exactly yeah so it's always kind of funny when people are like what do you want to talk about I'm like your body the your entire life like let's start there (laughs) yeah and so circling back to what you were saying you might want to check out I have a video on my YouTube oh man what's it called I think it's called expansion versus inner work. Um, I hope that's what it's called. Uh, Either that or, or it might be called stop trying to figure your life out. Let's see here. Um, I see stop doing inner work. It's 11 minutes. Stop stop doing inner work and do this instead. That's the one. Okay. It's a vertically shot. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Watch that video. Because that's going to show you how to operate more as the higher self and to, because a lot of people are what I call inner workaholics. And probably me at some level. <laughs> and, and inner work, you know, it's, it's, it's valid and valuable for certain reasons, but it's overused. You know, the, the purpose of inner work, especially in the beginning, is to teach you compassion and forgiveness. At its core, that's what it does. It teaches you compassion for yourself, teaches you self-forgiveness, which roots you more deep, uh, deeply in your being so that you can access things such as inspiration and fun and joy. You know, helps you move through traumas and stuff like that. But once you're plugged into your being in a certain way and you could feel lightness to any degree, then you could choose to operate more like your higher self, which is more through expansion, which is what the video goes into. But in essence, what it talks about is you might have noticed if you or anyone's an inner workaholic, your life will feel something like this where you're like, oh, wait, okay, I realize I have this problem with my inner child. Okay, let me look at that. Let me focus on it. Let me solve it. And then you solve it and you you get whatever liberation and then you feel high for a little bit 
and you're like, ah, yes. And then another layer comes in or another thing comes in. You're like, oh, crap. And then, and then you work on it. And then your life kind of feels like this up, down, up, down, up, down, this constant up, down. The reason for it is because as an inner workaholic, if you're constantly focused on fixing your problems, then the universe can only give you more problems to fix. Sounds like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. So that's why I say it's a brilliant illusion because it gives you the impression of, of like, ah, I did it. And then another thing comes, ah, I did it. Right. It's those temporary highs where with the expansion method that you'll find in the video, it'll show you how to place your focus on your potential and your power and as a side effect, solve your issues and problems. And then since your focus is on your potential and your power, guess what you get more of? More everything <laughs> in short. Exactly. More thought. Yeah. And it, exactly. <laughs> exactly. More, more, more thought, more thought. divine thought. More divine thought. <laughs> oh, I like that. Um, one yes. question that I do have for you is, and you might've already answered this, but just in case I've, yes. I haven't asked, I try to ask everybody this, but I've been slacking a little bit. So what is, uh -huh. what was when you were a little kid, the very first thing that you wanted to be whenever you grew up? A father, a father. Yeah. That might be a first for this podcast. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to be, well, if I backtrack even a little more, I want it to be Leonardo the Ninja Turtle. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty dope. <laughs> that, that was my my everything. I literally used to go to sleep every night. As soon as I would close my eyes, I would go into now what I could recognize as a lucid dream. But every dream, I was Leonardo the Ninja Turtle, son of God, which meant I had all the magical powers in the world. And April O'Neil was my girlfriend. And every night for six years, for five years... I was out there saving the world and whenever I needed help or guidance or more powers, I would go down a Mario pipe up to the heavens to go see God, dad, and get more magic powers. And he would strike me with a lightning bolt. I'd get more magic or get whatever advice and I'd continue to save the world. And that's what happened for five years. And then that's what disappeared uh. when I was when I remet my and, and why I went on the journey of trying to find how to reclaim that. And when I met my magic, <laughs> uh, and then is that when you wanted to become a dad was whenever you severed, let's say that connect severed, severed is a strong word. You disconnected from that astral plan. Well, no, probably not. Like, you know, so my first, that's kind of what sparked up. Like my first desire was to be Leonardo Ninja Turtle. But when it came to like school and, I remember like everyone being asked, like, what do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? My answer was a dad because I wanted to be the father that I never had. I gotcha. And so, so that was my inspiration. That's deep. Yeah. And now I have a great connection with my father. By the way. I <laughs> just, love it. Comes full circle. Just, just, to give, <laughs> okay. just to give the full circle. Yeah. Just so we don't have to sit too deep there. That's, that's honestly yeah. really amazing though, too, that you, you keep having these, it seems to me like you keep taking these very interesting perspectives on the life situations that you're put in where I feel like I would naturally gravitate towards, or at least I don't know if it's me. I'm actually projecting, I think for a majority of society where like, if they don't have a dad, they just wouldn't want to be a dad, right? Because they see mm. the terribleness of not being a dad yet. It seems to me that you see like the positive side of it where, you know, even mm. going back to what we were saying earlier with um, all those spiritual leaders who are making over six figures and you see how much stress they had, you're like, Oh no, wait, I want to be the proof that you don't have to be this way. So I don't, right. it seems like you always have like this interesting perspective flip on the things that occur in your life. <laughs> that's interesting. I, I never thought of it that way. And yeah, that's, that's true. I've always, always, always been like that. You know, that's just kind of the nature of my being. And, and, and that's where I give thanks to my mom. You know, she's always, been that way with me too she's always encouraged a positive outlook and seeing positivity and so yeah for me there's no other way you know i don't i don't perceive problems i perceive opportunities next time i meditate or channel i'm gonna need to call in some of your energy with perspective <laughs> <Hope you don't laughs> <mind. laughs> well that's actually one of the exercises i give people who want to learn how to tune into spirit guides is to first start by using people you know as spirit guides oh. you know so if so if you're inspired by me or if you're inspired by whoever else you know to bring that person into your awareness and imagine and sense what they would say in response to whatever question you have and then bring in a different person that you trust and look up to or respect 
and see what response you get over there. And because that will, what that teaches you is how to shift frequencies and what, what's meant by the term shift frequencies. Because you're going to feel the difference between speaking to me as a spirit guide versus speaking to, I don't know, Bashar as a spirit guide, whoever. And then as you get comfortable with the idea of shifting frequencies, you can let yourself become aware of what frequencies are already there available to you that you might not have a picture for, but you can sense and that will end up being a spirit guide of some sort that you can tune into and communicate with over there as well. It's a very practical exercise. Yeah. That's crazy. It's reminding me of the book Tho- throw no, not throw. Uh think oh, think and grow think and grow rich because at the end of it he actually talks about you know, it's a book all about making money and, you know, s- development, but there is this very interesting parallel of like spiritual elements that are actually in it, but he doesn't come out straightforward and say it. And at the end of it is like a technique that you're talking about here, where he says to bring in like almost 10, he says, I think he says, start out with five, but then you can like work your way up, but like five dinner guests of people who you want to emulate. And, you know, I saw this as like, you know, a list celebrities who I wanted to embody some of their energy, you know, and, for instance, like Joe Rogan or like a, a Gary V or um, I'm trying to think of who other people I had in, on my panel, maybe like Jesus was there or something. And the idea was, mm-hmm. is like, if I have a problem, just like give it to these people and see the conversation that they would all have around it. And then you're able to then kind of play with ideas in this realm of, you know, the mind, if you will, and, and see how thought leaders of today would give you answers of your problems now. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it stretches your mind, stretches your imagination, and allows you to think outside the box, so to speak, because you're not getting answers from your, your logical thinking mind, you're, you're using more of your, your right brain, your, your, your creative side of your brain that could, you know, you're consciously accessing the so called on unconscious, which is magical ability. Mm. Yeah, because it's, it's interesting too. It almost gives you like this permission to think outside the box too, right? Because you're, it's no longer you that's thinking it. It's my rendition of Gary Vee or it's my rendition of Jesus who is giving me the answer to this question. I'm curious, how do you, yes. how do you think that this intertwines with uh, the idea of like, um, I don't know, like kind of like boundaries or like, like kind of, uh, like energy work, if you will. Cause I know there's like a shadow side to it where you could like, put, let's say put dark spells on somebody or like, like, mm-hmm. I don't know how to articulate this, but at least like, you know, let's use you for an example, right? How I kind of started this off with like, Oh, then I'm just going to channel David Lyon to like, help me find my magic ball. If you will, it, is that kind of, if we never had this conversation, like how mm-hmm. much of a, of a trespass is that on, your energy or your frequency if zero. you will zero Z- yeah zero because what you're actually doing mechanically i love this question um is you're using your energy to create the experience of david lyon based off of what you've learned from my frequency so that you can channel that towards yourself you're not actually affecting my energy or, or in any way, it's kind of like when people say, um, um, you know, this person was impacting my energy or, you know, um, you know, the basically beliefs of outside things impacting their energy where the experience of it might seem like that, but that's not actually what's happening mechanically. When you look at it, the only thing you can ever experience is your own energy. There's no room for anything else within you. There's just your own Mm. energy. But what you can do is you can shift your frequency to create the experience of experiencing other people's energies. And that might be your interpretation of it, but you're using your energy to do so. Otherwise, you wouldn't be an empowered being. We we wouldn't be a co-creator. You know, and so for example, empaths have this issue a lot where they're just like, oh, I I can't go to the bar. I can't go to the mall because, you know, the people there are too heavy or I pick up on people's energy and and all these things. 
And so they think that the outside world is affecting them. But mechanically, that's not what's happening. Mechanically, most of the time, you know, someone who's like always picking up on someone's stress and anxieties and emotions, more often than not, if I explore with them, I will find that they have a hero complex of some sort and that they like to be a savior. And so since they have a subconscious belief of wanting to save people from their issues, they will literally mechanically create the experience of taking on people's issues so that they can save it and deal with it themselves. But they're creating that game and experience for themselves because you release the mechanic and it changes it changes the dynamics. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because I mean, you know, I definitely identify as being like an empath and I know in my life where if I'm in a certain situation, I've had tendencies of like, ah, oh, am I stuck because I'm hanging out with this person or going out and doing this? But, but it, it, it seems disempowering even whenever you kind of put it in that light of wait, wait, hold on. I, I'm this infinite being of multidimensionality and I can't handle going out with people who are quote unquote vibrating at lower rates, which at one level is actually just a judgmental thing. But yet, you know, there's like, it's almost like there's the shielding that you need to put in place in order to maybe not even shielding, but just like allowing yourself to experience energies without taking them on as your own. Right. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a belief system. You know, this is where we go into the, the like the mechanics of ourselves. And I, I love this world, but it's kind of like, have you ever noticed that, you know, there's, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a group of people who are very big on psychic protection. You got to protect your energy. You got to protect your field. All right. Classical high energy interrupt. You guys know the drill, but uh, <laughs> sorry, David, what were you saying? So you'll notice that there's a group of people who believe in psychic protection. You know, you got to shield your energy. You got to protect your energy. And there's all this belief around that. Have you ever noticed that people who believe in psychic protection are the people who experience the most psychic attacks. Now that you say it. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I want to say yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at it, you'll you'll see it's it's interesting and and it's all because of the mechanics. You know, in if you believe in a protection, which is a a, a fear-based thing to create. So which means you're operating in duality. So if for you to have a protection, that means that you believe that there's something you need to protect yourself against, which means you need to attract that in order to have use for a protection. Mm, or at least you need to at least create that entity in your mind to exist in order for it to come into your awareness. Right. Because I never experienced psychic attacks and I never use protections in that way. You know, for me, my quote unquote protection is just my meanness. It's just my true frequency. For me, that's the only quote unquote protection I need mm. because the only thing I'm letting in is that which resonates with my true frequency. I get so that. In so instead of, you know, using sage, you be the sage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I really like that. No, because I definitely, there's a couple people, I don't want to put them on the spot, but a couple, uh, let's say, spiritual people who I've seen who are like, Oh, I've just been like attacked. And it's like, Oh, da, da, da. and there always has been a part of me is like, like why, you know, it's like this element of, you know, if you're so powerful, if we are so powerful, which of course we are, I'm mm -hmm. all in on it. It's like, why am I, why am I feeling like you, this should not be happening. Right. Or like, why shouldn't this actually be manifesting? And yeah, it's like, huh? Yeah. It's because they believe they need to protect themselves from something. So therefore, right. that something must manifest in some way. <laughs> oh, man. Well, David, you've got, given me a lot to think about in this podcast. So I'm super, super grateful for that. And usually whenever those little interrupts happen, it means that we need to start wrapping it up. So I'm going <laughs> to give you the floor. Please speak to the audience. Encourage them. Plug your stuff. I got all your links, so I'll throw those down in the show notes below. Please reference those at will. And with that being said, David Lyon, the floor is yours. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, as you may have gathered through listening to me, you know, my passion is really to activate your magic to bring you into that space of your higher self and your spiritual gifts, and your liberation and freedom in really fun and joyful ways. And so if that's something that you want to experience more of, uh, you can check me out on Instagram at davidlion.love. 
I also have a YouTube, David Lion. Lion is spelt like the animal. And if you want to check more about my offerings and services, you could always go to my website, which is www.livingmagic.life. And that's where you're going to find my opening to channel training, which I mentioned earlier, which is all around how to uh, develop and master your spiritual gifts in really fun and practical ways and become embodied in your higher self and purpose and all those things, as well as um, I have another service called Guided Growth. That one's more... Uh, opening the channel is for those who are really devoted to their spiritual path and, and becoming a confident channeler and who want to show up in their gifts in that way uh, and channel wisdom at will, where guided growth is more so for people who never want to feel stuck again. You know, I, I built guided growth from the from that question of like, what if you never had to feel stuck again? And, you know, how can I reach the most people? So you could check that out as well. Um, you get a one month free when you sign up to it. And after that, it's 33 bucks a month. But I'll let you check that out on the website, livingmagic.life. It sounds very affordable. And I know getting stuck is something that I've felt before. So I'll have to check that out. And then also, I just want to add on in case you guys were just listening straight through the podcast. The two videos of David's that we talked about was Soul Magic, Activate Your Spiritual Gist, Guided Hypnosis, which is like an hour and nine minute it looks like meditation and then the other one was dear spiritual people slash slash stop doing inner work and do this instead which is like a vertical <laughs> film which i know i will be diving into shortly after we get off recording this um but with all that being said david thank you so much for being here guys go check him out he's on instagram as well that david lion dot love yes and other than that, if we don't see you guys there, then we will for sure see you guys in the sixth dimension. <laughs>